Welcome back to the True Geordie podcast, Welcome. sponsored by Jim Shock. Uh, today's guest, long time coming. This has been a long time. I've always wanted to have Dorian on. I, I, I trained with you uh, about ten years ago. Um, yeah, forgive me for not remembering. Well, not you mean. Well, I had a lot of people come to yeah. train with me, and you Can't probably look a lot me. different now as well. No, I was, not really. Uh, to be honest, not really. <laughs> um, I, I kind of looked forty when I was twenty, but. Um, <laughs> But it, it was a, an eye opener because I'd always, um, well, my dad was a bodybuilder in the 90s and, you know, uh, at a lower level, you know, like the NABA stuff. And, yeah. that, and he, um, he always told me about like the great bodybuilders. And I remember distinctly him going, Dorian Yates is the one. He's the one you want to listen to. So I went on YouTube and I started watching these videos and it like, you go down the rabbit hole and, and I'm like, wow, this guy, because you, you had a total different vibe to every other posing bodybuilder. And before I knew it, I was watching Blood and Guts and like, I basically knew everything about you. So when, when I trained with you, I, I always tell this story the same way I say it. Because you were about, well, how old do you know? 60 in April. So You wow. look fucking unbelievable for your age, by Thank the way. Thank you. So you must have been about 50. And you were still carrying quite a lot of size back then. I was, yeah. Yeah, and you you walked through the door and your back walked through the door five minutes later. You were so like, and I, that's when I realized in that one moment, I'm not meant to be a bodybuilder because like your genetics, it really, it really made me realize, okay, the density of muscle that you, the proportions and everything, you just didn't look like a normal guy. And that would have been 10 years ago. So 2010, 2011, mm. I mean, that was, 13, 14 years after yeah. my competitive career. So I wasn't anywhere still near That's what, made me what I used to be. This is him know? sort of over the hill. Yeah, I was probably about, <laughs> uh, probably holding around 18 and a half, yeah. 19 you stone look 19 at that stone. point. Yeah, at yeah. that point. And off season in bodybuilding or somewhere between 21 and 22 stone. So yeah. imagine another two stone or two and a half stone on top of that. Yeah, but you could, I could see the building blocks of what you'd created. There was, it was still there, which yeah. was obviously sh shrunk, but still it was, it was just out of, like a lot of people just think bodybuilders take steroids and then boom, they, they get big. But like uh, the, the proportions and the aesthetics and everything that went into it, it, it just sort of struck me. And then I trained with you. And then I was even more convinced I wasn't supposed to be a bodybuilder. <laughs> yeah, this is what it takes day in, day yeah. out. I mean, you know, are you prepared to do that? Can you do that? And ultimately your genetics is like, it's a limiter to how far you can go. Uh -huh. You know, I, I could practice basketball and play basketball all day long from 10 years old, but I'll never be a basketball player because yeah. I don't have the characteristics of a basketball player don't you know, do yourself down like that i think you could have a very good career in this. yeah <laughs> fantastic. Well, i'm definitely a white man because i can't jump right yeah. sure, fair <laughs> enough yeah that's probably 19 i can't jump this, yeah. I, I got no coordination mm. so i wouldn't be a, a basketball player no matter how much i practice so with bodybuilding everybody can improve that's that's the message but not everybody can be a, a professional bodybuilder or a mr olympia and you know mm. talking about steroids how many people in the world now, how many men are taking steroids? It'll be in the millions, right? So there's only one Mr. Mr. Olympia. Olympia, there's only one person. Mm. So yes, they are part of the game and they do help a lot, I guess. Um, it was the training that, that messed my head up, by the way. It was what like, was it exactly? That, so I, yeah. I remember, right? He's got this machine in the temple gym. You put your arms back. Pull I, a, Nautilus pull over machine. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, so I was like, I want to train back with Dorian East because yeah. that was one of your main things that you were known for. I was like, what is this like? And after the first whatever, however many, I mean, even the warm up, I was like, God, his warm ups are pretty intense. Whatever I let myself in for. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was starting to realize. Uh, so then. Was this one on one? So just to yeah, create a little. It was one on one. Yeah, image one on one. I do train, you know, I coach people in various ways, one on one in the gym and uh, I got a platform that I help people, DY mm. Academy. So I like actually like helping, coaching people and probably of all the aspects of bodybuilding, because there's many aspects, you've got the training, you've got the nutrition, you've got the, the chemical side, you've got the contest prep. But I love the training and I love to find the best way to train and I had a passion for it. And I, over the years um, <coughs> as well, you know, a lot of people know, but I logged every single workout. So every workout from 1983 to 1997, I got it all logged down. And I, you know, I train a little bit more frequently, an extra day this week or, you know, some change there. And I would be able to analyze it. Is mm -hmm. this beneficial? Is this not beneficial? And 
Um, I had the theory of HIT training from Arthur Jones, from Mike Menser. So the theory appealed to me because it was logical, and that's the way my brain works. It works in logic and mathematics and straight lines. Um, so the theory was sound. But if the theory sounds great and it doesn't work out in practice, it don't mean shit. So uh, I analyzed it and I noted if I train more frequently, if I do a bit too much, then my progress was just stopping and then it was cutting back. And uh, I observed the people I train, many people I've helped, and it's, it's always the same story. But it's kind of hard for people to get in their mind so little, tra oh, so little, uh, it's little in time and volume, but it's very high in it's intensity hell. as it's you hell. find out yeah you, yeah. you brutalize yourself uh -huh. for a very short period of time and then you let your body recover and overcompensate and grow and that's the process Th that, that process is something that i think people think they understand because they watch a video like i yeah. could watch blood and guts and go oh yeah I'll, I'll i'll do that this is the the training video that dorian was very famous for because no one had ever put out an authentic bodybuilding workout like that they were all in little stringers on the beach and that's dorian, exactly why i did it yeah it was I completely different it because i you know i you start as a fan right uh -huh. and you know, i'm looking forward to watching these vhs that came out road to the olympia and the different training and i'm like is this really the way they train i don't think so i'm not getting inspired by this so when i had a chance to do it and i realized why that happened because at that time you know we all got iphones and cameras and everything back in the 80s and 90s you had to have a professional camera crew to come and do it and the camera crew want to do it from their perspective from their point where they want the perfect lighting the perfect angles and if you're going to take time to do all that you're going to lose the authenticity of the the workout so i had a friend who was a photographer kevin horton i said kevin let's just hire a video filming camera but i want you to come in and i'm going to train as normal i don't want you to talk to me i don't want you to mess about with lights or anything i just want you to capture the workout and the intensity and the weights and the feeling and nobody cares about shades and angles and lights they want to see the and, they, and i want people to watch that training video and get pumped up and want to go to the gym mm -hmm. and i obviously achieved that because i've heard it a million times like dorian i play that before i go to the I've, gym i've watched it i've, wor I've times. worn the tape out then yeah. i got the dvd and i worn the dvd out so yeah. I, I was really happy with the results and uh i was watching the playbacks after we filmed it and i said something's wrong with this i said tell you what can you turn off the color and just make it black and white and he did that and i was like that's it it's badass yeah i got inspired by this uh, you know the raging bull the robert de niro yeah. <coughs> boxing movie when it's all in black and white and it's just mm. so much more gritty and realistic yeah. and that's what i wanted to put across and, and that helped your vibe as well <coughs> because what dorian had which even though bodybuilding is a contest where you're not competing actually contact with each other you had this intimidation factor and i could only compare it to mike tyson or someone like that it, it the vibe you were giving off was like I'm not yet a smile and be a model. No. I'm an athlete, and this is my my profession. And you you put a completely different slant on it than anyone else I've ever seen. Really. Yeah, I mean the whole enigma, the the shadow, and everything like that could have been a well thought out image and strategy, but it wasn't. It was just me being me, and I was kind of introvert. I didn't like the limelight. I mean, it's part of it. You got to go on stage and do it, but that's it's once a year, right? Mm. Um, so I didn't want to show people what I was doing and the guys in the gym that, that trained at Temple Gym they'll tell you even the guys that trained with me my training partners they never saw me without a top on they never saw me without a top on until probably three or four weeks before the Olympia and I'd do a little I'd invite a couple of people down from the bodybuilding community whose opinions I respected because they knew what they were looking at because they'd been you know judging the Mr. Olympia or they've been they've seen the top guys they know them they know what they're looking at <coughs> <clears throat> and I would, you know, three or four weeks before, I'd uh, invite them down and, you know, say what you think and mm. this and that. But apart from that, and I wasn't interested in, if I took my top off every day at the gym, I would just go, oh, you're, you're amazing. You, you know, you beat everybody. You're in shape now. You don't need to do anymore. And I didn't need to hear that from people that didn't really know what they're looking at. I, I can't stress enough, right, because I've trained, in, I've done boxing, I've done lots of different training. I've never felt more exhausted and more like wanting to quit than when I trained with you. And very early on in the workout yeah. as well, I remember thinking, I'm on my fourth set of like whatever we were gonna do, 60 and 20 sets. How am I feeling like I'm dying already? And I remember after the first machine was done, this noteless, yeah. um, the, right into your lats, I, 
I went beyond failure and you were doing force reps with me and I just remember thinking, I'm gonna basically embarrass myself in front of Mr. Olympia here because I want to quit right now already. Yeah, and it, it just, yeah. and I went back to the gym. You weren't gonna, mate. I wouldn't let you. No, anyway. but I went back to the gym the next week, and all my mates were there. And I went, lads, we don't train hard. We yeah. think we do, right? But we're chatting, we're taking our time. Yeah, we lift heavy weight, yes. but we're not training hard. That the focus is about the focus. Yeah, so you're in there, and you're just there, and your mind's inside the muscle. Nothing else exists, and you're pushing to the extreme. And how hard you push is. It's only a matter of motivation mm. because your mind is the, you know, it's the mind that fails before the body. And that's what I show people when they come and train with me. I show them techniques, show them the form, sh you know, I, sh I show all that. But it's, I often tell people, look, you, you were going to, you wanted to stop at 10 there. Yeah. But because I'm here and because I'm shouting at you and I'm pushing you, you did 14, you did 15. You did it. Yeah. You lift, I didn't lift it for you. But I motivated you. So it's obviously a matter of motivation how far you're going to push. And for me, bodybuilding was a way to change my life. And it was the mentality I put myself in is that I'm fighting for my life here. And when I turn pro, I'm like the other guys are trying to take food off my table, off my family, off my kids. And I'm going to there for a battle. I'm not mm. going to there to smile. I just, you know, I'm going there to win the contests. And uh, that was my frame of mind. So... And I th it was to my advantage that I was in the UK. I was in this little hole in the ground in, in Birmingham and nobody saw me all year round. Mm. So this guy that you can't see, somehow, you know, it's building like fear up in your mind because you can't see him, you don't know anything about him. So that you're, you're, to my you're advantage. Like, you're spoken about, but no one sees you. It's almost like a fictional character who shows yeah, up once yeah. a year and just steals dreams. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, crushes people and goes back home to his, you know, back in his basement. But that's, yeah. I mean, people ask me like, could you be the shadow now these days? Uh, probably not. Yeah, because, you, you know, you need to be visible to, you know, to generate a living and everything now. Where then I just had to be in the magazines and that I would do once a year after I competed, I was in shape, I would do all, you know, all the shoots, all the interview, everything in a week period in Los Angeles. And then I'll disappear again. It's the power of the mind with you. That's one thing that really struck me. And I was, I was really into MMA when I was learning about you as well. And I remember thinking, this is like a fighter mentality in bodybuilding. I think so, yeah. yeah. I think uh, I had a different mentality. And actually, I did the first sports slash exercise type of thing I was doing was when I was a kid, I was doing karate. Uh -huh. So I think that always stayed with me. Even my posing, if you watch it, it's a little bit martial compared to the other guys, a bit more... Fluid. flowing and stuff mine's a bit like oh, oh. it's like i'm here Power, wasn't it? i'm yeah. here you know and that reflected my physique and my persona which is important when you're when you're presenting yourself i wasn't a frank zane or a bob paris or anything like that i was you know big powerful strong guy so that had to come across in the presentation yeah and and like just to be clear for those who don't know uh, anything about bodybuilding you i feel like there's two bodybuilders who had a huge impact compared to everyone else one is Arnold and one is you. Arnold sort of started it and you changed it. And it was like those two pivotal, important moments in the game. Um, do you agree yeah, with my, that? my mentality was in stages. You know, I, um, I wanted to be the best in the UK and I wanted to change my life. Mm. Uh, I, I kind of, I did a little bodybuilding when I was at school and left school and my life was very chaotic. I, I left home at 16 and... Uh, I got in a bit of trouble. I was in a detention center and in there they had weights and there were 300 guys in there. And I quickly realized I got the best physique in here, like naturally, and I'm pretty much the strongest guy in here. So this is something I can do that's positive for my life. And I didn't know at that point that, that would lead to being Mr. Olympia and everything. I just knew if I put my energy into something positive, I would get something positive back. Maybe I'll win some contests. Maybe I'll oh maybe i can open my own gym one day or something that was how it started yeah the 90s were so different like everyone's sort of combat sports are the thing now but my dad's era in the 90s you always was like if you weren't a bodybuilder you were no one like yeah, it, to my dad i think it was a peak of interest in bodybuilding yeah. and now you know in the 90s we had bodybuilding we didn't have fitness crossfit men's physique yeah. we didn't have mma all these other 
avenues that people might take now the all, those kind of guys were all going into bodybuilding everyone wanted to be a bodybuilder mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s it was the peak of the popularity although i suppose the industry as a whole is bigger now but it's it's much more diverse it's not just bodybuilding there's many more categories involved there was kind of an obsession i think in the 90s as well with people changing their bodies be that sort of bodybuilding in the gym or yeah. plastic surgery and those kind of things and that those two things seem to coincide a bit as well well, if you look at the movies, what were popular in the Baywatch. the late eighties? I mean, you you got all the Arnold's movies. Mm -hmm. They started with Conan and the Terminator. Then you got Stallone. Mm -hmm. So everybody wanted to, you know, mm -hmm. build their physique. Uh, now it's 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 a bit different, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, when you were talking about um, getting into trouble, and um, I'm aware you lost your father at a young age, and then you and your mother were that particularly close. Yeah, I wondered if if that. Uh, difficulty that you had growing up sort of gave you that mental strength that you had because we, we always hear about how a fighter take uh, Kamara Usman of the UFC right now like the, some people who've had a rough start in life they seem to be able to go to another level that people who've maybe been moddy coddled just can't go Ab to absolutely absolutely I remember seeing uh, um, not so long ago Mike Tyson's son on the pads and he you know he looked wow a bit Tyson-esque, you know? Yeah. And they asked Tyson, you know, would he make a champion? He's like, no way. <laughs> like, why not? Because he hasn't lived my life. He's, he's been comfortable. So yeah. he's not, he's not going to be able to do it. He's not going to have that inside him. And, uh, yeah, I didn't have a lot of options. And I felt I had to fight for everything. And um, I think my dad dying young, my mom not really being able to cope with me or, you know, with my anger and confusion mm. and everything like that um that was definitely a driving force and i had to grow up and look after myself pretty quick you know i was 16 and i was out on the street living at you know friends houses or something and get my own little place and i gotta look after myself there's nobody else that i can fall back on so you know that gives you kind of um you're either going to make it or you're going to you're going to fall and when I was in the detention center it was like a crossroads it was like which which way do you want to go here you've had a taste of this and I, pff, mm -hmm. I don't belong here I don't you know, I don't you know even the the, the prison officers were saying you don't belong here you well know. you're a very smart guy I mean that they, they, they were like you're, you're an intelligent yeah. guy you don't belong here well, I don't have any paperwork to say I am but <laughs> I you know I got that innate kind of uh uh, you're a scientist kind of thing the way you yeah, try I, I analyze everything yeah. I analyze everything got that analytical brain and I'm always asking questions <coughs> and I'm always wanting to know the truth and I hate to think I don't know the truth and someone's pulling the wool over my eyes and I'm being fooled um, and I you know I didn't there was no such thing then as the culture that you've got now you've got a nutritionist you've got a coach you've got you know whatever it's now that kind of making bodybuilding into a team sport for, for me it wasn't not the team sport it's a individual effort and i didn't have a team i didn't want to have a yeah. team i want to i do it myself i'm if i win it's i'm responsible if i lose i'm responsible and i'm not saying i didn't listen to anybody to any advice or any information i'll get some from here some from here some from you some from him and then i would shift right. through it all and, and see what made sense and ultimately what works were there any key figures that you sort of remember being influential on you uh, yeah, there was a guy um, called Ron Davis. He was the head of the EFBB, which is the English Federation from IFBB, which is the federation that promotes Mr. Olympia. So that's, you know, that's the ultimate contest, Mr. Olympia. If you're a bodybuilder, that's, there's only one contest that's important. That's it. And um, so I went to do my first contest after I'd been training for about a year and a half. And I went to do a novice contest. And, you know, I went there thinking, you know, I'm pretty good for a novice. I should, I feel fairly confident I can win this qualifying contest. Then I want to go to the British Championship, novice championship and win that. And then the next year, maybe the, you know, the British Championship itself. Um, so I went on stage, did my compulsory poses that you have to do and I came back off stage. And the, these guys were there, these officials from the, you know, and Ron was there. And they're like... Hey, who, who are you? Where do you come from? I'm like, I come from Birmingham. And what, what are you doing in the novice class? You should be in the heavyweights. I said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not good enough for the heavyweights yet. And they're, they're practically laughing at me. Yeah. So it's not good enough. 
do you know you're probably the best heavyweight we got in the country right now? Not good enough to be in a heavyweight, yeah. mate. It's like, and uh, Ryan had a gym in, in Birmingham called Muscle Machine, and he invited me down there to train, and you know, basically told me, said, you, you know, you could be Mr. Olympia one day. So he knew, he, you know, he recognised the potential. Wow. And uh, I trained there for a little while, but it was too, uh, it was too civilised for me. You know, they had the office people come in to train on their lunch break, and uh, you know, I want to spit on the floor and growl and sweat and it just wasn't that environment so I went you know I said thanks Ron for your help and everything but I got to go back I got to go back to the ghetto I got to you know go back to my roots and that energy um, I'm scaring the people in here you know <laughs> so it, w it wasn't the right place yeah, but you, Ron, you're loud when you train that's Ron, what Ron, you know whatever it takes I don't know I'm not conscious about it I'm yeah. pushing myself to the limit and if you're doing that you're probably going to make some noise yeah. um, so Ron gave my confidence a little boost I think that was more than anything mm. um, and there was a guy from Birmingham as well he had a supplement company called Tropicana he gave me my sp first sponsorship which was 10,000 a year and he again he said look I want to sponsor you when you go to America I think you're going to do really well and if you get a better offer than this like take it and I'll stop it wherever you want to I don't know so he, he was a good guy that got behind me a little bit. In, in terms of guiding you, though, like in terms of sort of mental guidance and those kind of things, was there? Were you? Do you feel like you were quite on your own when it came to absolutely, deciding? Absolutely, yeah, right. absolutely. And you know, I'm not a coachable person. I don't think you know because a coach would tell me to do that, and I'd be like, why? And you know, in the end, I'd do my own thing anyway. So as far as training and nutrition and all that stuff um i pretty much just worked it out myself so it was just people that give me a little bit of encouragement really and i think um because i lost my dad and i didn't have a, a male role model the guys in the magazines or at least what was projected in the magazines from the guys they became all those my, my surrogate fathers back then all the best bodybuilders came from the states all the contests were in the states the industry was there were you not known about in America at this Absolutely point? Absolutely nobody knew me. Nobody? Nobody knew yeah. me. So I'm going to New York and I don't know anything about New York. Where to go, where to train, where to stay or anything. So I contacted the, somebody from the Federation in England say, look, you know, I'm going over, but I don't know. And can you introduce me to somebody? I need somewhere to train and all this stuff. Um, so he introduced me to the promoter. And the promoter came to pick me up at the airport and I saw him before he saw me, and I was like, hey, Wayne, I'm, I'm Dorian Yates. He's like, oh, oh, uh, okay, come on then. And he said, uh, I was looking for a black guy. <laughs> you know what it is? Dorian, Dorian is a name is that you could yeah. associate with that. I get uh, I'm saying, why are you looking for a black guy? Yeah. He's like, because you've got a funny name. <laughs> And up to this point, all the good bodybuilders from UK were black. So I just assume you'll be black. I said, no, I'm sorry, just, I'm white, you know. <laughs> anyway, it's a funny story. He, he picked me up. So he said, you know, we've um, arranged a gym for you and we've arranged accommodation. There's a guy who's got an apartment for you and all that near the gym and it's all good, yeah? So, okay, so it's 2, 3 a.m. In, in the morning. I mean, I'm exhausted. I'm like super depleted you know you know three percent body fat dehydrated my face is like that i'm exhausted yeah quick question about this yeah. though how, you know like how bodybuilders are traveling all the time yeah they're obviously taking steroids steroids you can't really get them through customs i'm guessing yeah like what 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 do they do when like well actually in 1990 there was there was a big thing in the, in the states i think i don't know when it was like 91 92 something like that where steroids became illegal and it was big hoo-ha because people in bas baseball were using it and uh -huh. baseball is the apple and apple pie american clean yeah. sport listen no clean no sport is clean sports are about winning with highly competitive individuals and they will do whatever it takes to win in any sport the same thing applies yeah, yeah. um so at that point i just take it with me and in in the future, I used to mail it over ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Hope I don't get arrested in America. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you. I just had to know that. Um, so I was with Wayne. We went in his car and uh, go to the gym. He said, "We're going to meet the guy outside the gym, and he's going to take you to his apartment, and you're going to stay there." And I got my wife with me. I got my big bag with my little oven cooker in there, and everything. I was like, a, everything I did was like a military campaign, you know, tick this, I got this, I got that. I didn't want any, leave anything to chance, yeah? So we pull outside this gym and there's a guy there and he's like, hi. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. What just happened? 
So obviously the guy in the gym, having no respect for British bodybuilders, just ask, does anyone in the gym want to put this guy up? Like he's coming from England, bodybuilding. He's going, oh, I'll do it, you know? Uh, <laughs> so then we're driving in New York and Wayne's telling me, you're on the Lower East Side. He said, it might look really rough here, but it's becoming, you know, gentrified, just like the East End of London, I guess. Right. Um, okay. He said, oh, I'll drop you off with the guy here. Dropped us off. The building next door is crack house with the police tape shut down. Wow. We go into this apartment building. It's got no lift, so I'm having to walk up the stairs. I'm exhausted, and it smells <laughs> of piss. And we go into the apartment, and the bedroom door's open, and there's a naked guy lying on the bed. <laughs> And then he's got me this little room with homoerotic pictures on the wall. Oh, God. I don't have anything against homosexual people, but it's, it's not, just... No, it's not for you. It's just not my sure, thing, that's fine. It's not, not that's my fine. environment, you know? And, uh, this is the folk, this is... This, this, this is 1990, yeah. you know, with the AIDS thing, and people didn't really <coughs> understand all what it was and how you get it and everything. And the guy's like, would you like a tea or a coffee? And my wife's telling me, no, 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 no. And she didn't want to drink from the cups or anything, you know? So... I said, mate, I said, I need to talk to you. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, yeah, but, you know, I got my contest coming up and everything. I'm trying to be as polite as possible. Um, this living in <laughs> area is not suitable for me. Yeah? I need to get a hotel. And I need a hotel with a kitchen apartment, preferably. And he's like, yeah, I'll do that in the morning. I'm like, mate, I don't think you understand. You need to do that now. Get on the phone and do that now. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's funny because he, he got me a hotel. It was called the Chelsea Hotel in Chelsea in, in, in Manhattan. And, and uh, as a teenager, I was a skinhead. Skinhead. Or, uh, skinheads and punks in Birmingham, they all stick together because they couldn't get into any pubs. So there was one pub in Birmingham. All skinheads, all punks went there. So I know all the story about Sid Vicious uh, from the Sex Pistols. And Sid Vicious killed his girlfriend, Nancy, in the Chelsea Hotel. So I was like, isn't that weird? Of all the hotels, so in my life, it always sees these little synchronicities. Sorry, so you turn to your wife and you go, isn't it weird, Sid Vicious killed his wife here? Yeah, anyway, yeah, in we yeah, go. Here we go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, that was it. And then I went to the gym in, in New York that, <laughs> that was, um, you know, uh, look, supposed to be looking after me. And I went there and I said, I'm Dorian and this and that. Yeah, yeah go and go and train. And, and basically they were, they were pretty rude to me. Pretty rude and disrespectful because this guy from England, yeah, it's not good. Still got your top one. Yeah, I've still got the top yeah. one training. Then afterwards, there's changing rooms downstairs and there's a little area with mirrors so I could do my posing. Yeah, So you know, after the workout, I was stripped off, started doing posing. I didn't know there was a little camera up there that went to a TV behind the desk upstairs. Half the gyms come down, the owner, everyone that works there that was before not giving a shit. Yeah? Oh, like, wow, you're amazing, and blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, oh, the whole atmosphere changed then. Anyway, I went to uh, Night of Champions, yeah, held in Manhattan. And the New York crowd was very well known for being very vocal. I mean, New Yorkers are like that. They, mm -hmm. they don't like that, they're going to tell you, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I didn't really know what to expect. Anyway, came out and did my posing, initial posing, and did my, you know, unusually martial aggressive type pose and I was banging my foot on the floor when I did my calves and all this stuff and uh, it was quiet and then slowly the whole audience started going Dorian 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 yeah they must have been like who's this guy who's this guy who's this guy yeah. got and then they just started oh, I was like okay the crowds the crowds with me mm -hmm. so I got second at that contest to Mohammed Beneziza um, and Weeda must have seen something in me that was unique because I got I got invited out to Venice, California to do the shoots for the Weeder magazines at the Gold's Gym and that's every bodybuilder's dream at that point mm -hmm. that's you, you know you made it if you get so I got flown out to LA and did my first photo shoot out there how are you feeling at this time sorry because I know now you're telling it you're sort of, it's sort of like oh of course it's yeah. Dorian X but back then this must have felt quite different to you when you're surreal new to, yeah surreal you know so being in new york was surreal that this place is i'm here it's real new york and i've got second in this contest flown out to uh la saw a bit of a whirlwind you know and it's like the feeling like wow 
it's just really happening as I've really made it. I've been dreaming about this for years and I'm, I'm you know, I'm getting there now. Were you overawed or do you think you, you were the kind of person who took that in your stride at the time? Like, or was this something where you were a little bit like, hold on a minute, what is going on here? A little bit, yeah, but it's happening so fast, right. you know? And um, then I did my first photo shoot in, uh, in a Gold's gym there and they wanted me to wear sunglasses and they used to spray the guys with, water bottle so it looks like they're sweating and you know they hold these weights and they pose and everything i said mate i'm not wearing sunglasses good thing i had a british photographer chris lund so he could relate to me a little bit because the americans never really understood me why i'm not that guy that's always wanted attention why i'm not telling everyone how great i am and all the time and all this stuff they didn't get it you know i said chris i'm wearing sunglasses man i'm from <laughs> birmingham train underground i don't wear sunglasses and I want to lift some real weights. I don't want to mess about with this stuff. Let's lift some real weights. So it was a 200 pound dumbbell. I said, mate, oh, how about if I lift this and you get a shot of this? I'll do a dumbbell row. He said, can you lift that? I said, yeah, I can lift it, but I can't smile when I'm lifting it, mate. And I can't hold it there while you get the right angle. I'll get it up, mate. You better get the shot, yeah? And uh, he did that. And that was my first cover on the flex with a 200 pound dumbbell. Um, was that later, the one where you got blonde hair? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, the one, yeah. They're like a mullet. Yeah. I like that. It's funny because yeah. you and Brian have very similar uh, approaches to photo shoots, actually. <laughs> yeah. You either get it or you don't. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, you know, uh, Kevin Horton, who's a friend of mine, is British. So we had a good relationship, much better than I had with the other photographers. And people said, how is Dorian to do a photo shoot? He said, fucking miserable. <laughs> it just doesn't want to be there. It doesn't want to do it. So get it as quick as you can, mm -hmm. you know. And... Um, so from that point forward the whole way that they did the bodybuilding photography changed because i did this cover and i'm lifting a 200 pound dumbbell and you can't get the same look by lifting a light weight i mean literally the veins are sticking out my neck my eyes are bulging you can't pose that yeah so they were like ah oh, this is very popular people like this and they just started doing more and more of that as right. well wow you were like the first I, I, was, I was just me stubbornly being me. Right. You know, and not being able to be molded or manipulated. And, you know, everyone tried. It was very it. corny body, bodybuilding. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, like, Joe, Weider, Joe Weider came to one of my photo shoots. You remember he used to have Flex, which was the hardcore bodybuilding, yeah. and Muscle and Fitness, which was the more mainstream. And Muscle and Fitness always had a guy and a girl on the front cover. So, you know, it appeals to everybody. Let's get like a little skinny model and a bodybuilder on the and front the cheese on his shoulder like yeah right. this, this kind of stuff so uh, Dorian we're going to do a muscle and fitness <coughs> shoot with you let's go more mainstream you know flex you like okay but muscle and fitness and Joe came actually I remember asking Joe well Joe why are you coming to the photo shoots and all this stuff like if I was you and I had all your money mate I'd be on the beach and not bothering with all this nonsense yeah and he's like I'm not going to try and do his voice because everyone does it better but he had a very distinctive voice um, he basically said look I do what I love I love doing the magazines I love bodybuilding and if, I, if I'm not doing this what I'm going to do I'm just going to die early or something because mm -hmm. I don't have a mission so I learned that from him and he, he was great at like you know Joe Weider trainer of champions this is all a bullshit myth you know that he publicised he didn't train anybody but he was very good with photography and presentation and mm -hmm. posing he was very good at so he's like Dorian, smile. Well, I can't. And so my wife was there. Try and get him to smile. Try, the model, everybody, try and get him to smile. Try and, <laughs> what, show me your teeth. Is something wrong with your teeth? I was like, oh, there's nothing wrong with my teeth, man. I just can't do the smile. And he's trying and he's trying. And in the end, he just said, ah, just let this guy do what he wants. And that was, you know, from then, that's pretty much it. <laughs> just yeah. do what you want. You can't, you can't get him to do what he doesn't want. And, you know, if you're Mr. Olympia, you have that guess that power to, to say no to things oh. um so yeah that was my first uh trip out to uh to california which i say was every bodybuilder's dream at that point you you've kind of made it if you, you get on the cover of the magazine all right we're going to move that camera over slightly someone want to just move that just yeah, ever, we'll so move slightly over. ever so slightly it's all good he's <coughs> got big shoulders you know yeah exactly still half, got it half what they used to be still got it so big is to put two cameras that's a question I get asked so um, much, especially well, by the young guys. Just twist well, the, uh, don't the you of the camera. feel bad now that you're smaller? Or don't you wish you was still right. that guy and all that stuff? You know? what's, what's the reply to that? Because no, I'll be what I want to be. You know, it's uh, 
I am smaller and lighter because I want to be not doing what I think and this is where a lot of bodybuilders get trapped that's kind of the that's kind of the interesting aspect of it isn't it I think a lot of people assume that you wouldn't want to be you wouldn't want to get that way they don't they, they see it as a decline or, in that sense either that or the guy's thinking to himself but everyone associates me with being Mr. Olympia or being this big bodybuilder and if I'm not that guy anymore no one will love me no one will follow me <laughs> blah 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 mm -hmm. you know um you know, people are following me now for what I'm doing now, as well as like, you did, you know, I've got people that, okay, you did that in the past, but a lot of people are really appreciating what I'm doing now and being inspired by it because it's about change and evolution. And you have to be willing to change in life. Otherwise, did you get stuck in a mold? And I think that's what happens with a lot of bodybuilders. I'm a bodybuilder, I'm this guy, I'm Mr. Olympia, I'm this muscle guy, and I'm comfortable there because I know that but to change sometimes you have to be uncomfortable and you have to do and try things that's outside your comfort zone in order to to grow and evolve and I think that's what I've been doing or trying to do um, for some time now I broke the mold of I'm just a bodybuilder um, maybe that's not the best thing for me now anymore um, and carrying a lot of body weight is not the best thing for you as you're getting older that was actually one thing I was going to ask because um, obviously, you know, that's a lot of weight just to put on any joints in the first place. Exactly. Anything to the extreme is not very healthy. <laughs> Marathon running, triathlete running, bodybuilding, getting kicked in the head in the MMA, all that stuff. I try to tell people, you've got competitive sports and you've got exercise and, and sports and training for health. It's two different things. Competitive sports is concerned with only one thing and that's winning. And it's not necessarily, you know, we all know exercise is good for your health, but at what point does it become detrimental where you're, you know, for instance, endurance training, your body's producing so much free radicals that you're just aging and damaging your cells. Uh, a little bit of moderate exercise is great for you, but to the extreme, no. But those guys that are doing it, they're not doing this necessarily thinking this is for my health they're doing it as a challenge and as a sport and as a competition that they want to win i'm not i'm not even sure it's that anymore though as well it's because like you the reason you became the the guy i think it's because you don't think like the rest and when i look at a lot of lads i grew up with who aspired to be bodybuilders or wanted to just get massive a lot of those guys didn't have a good job, didn't have a lot going for them, and their whole identity was, well, if I get muscular, at least I've got that, and they live yeah, for that, and yeah. it becomes the only thing about them that is unique. I, I don't think they get it. Like, you know, you're, you're spending all this time on how you look, but you're mm -hmm. literally, you're pissing into the wind and wasting most of your life where you're never gonna be Mr. Olympia. Yeah. You're not even gonna make a money off of Instagram at this rate, and they, they some of them need a harsh reality check. The amount of lads I've met who've spent thousands of pounds on protein and steroids and to win the crappiest little trophy yeah. at a bodybuilding contest that no one cares about. And because in their head, when they're on that stage, they are you, they are. But in reality, it's like, mate, yeah, I don't well, know what I, you're doing. I was always for. very aware of that because, you know, I trained in the gym mm. and all the guys in the gym, I could see what they're doing. And uh, if you're gonna do bodybuilding to the extreme, Taking steroids carries some health risk. We can debate, you know, what that is, but it carries some risk. And um, I saw people sacrificing everything, you know, like they're spending all their money on it, sacrificing time with their families, being in like a bad mood and having a fight with their wife and all that because they're getting ready for a Mr. Real or mm -hmm. whatever, you know. Um, is that a competitive one? Mr. Rill. Yeah. I don't even know if it exists, but... <laughs> we'll find <laughs> it's, out, yeah. It's making a point, it's Mr... Uh, no disrespect Mr. to Mr. Rill. Mr. Dudley or... Mm. I don't know. It's like, I, I was very aware of that, and I actually put a deadline on myself. I said, all right, I'm doing all this, yeah? I'm doing all this. I'm losing time and focus w with my family. I, I don't have any social life. I'm sacrificing that. Uh, there's the health risk. Uh, all all these things is like all the energy and focus you've only got so much yeah so you put it all into that you don't have much left for anything else mm -hmm. um, so I said alright I'm British champion I'm pro now technically I can compete as pro I'm going to night champions my first pro show if I don't get in the top five 
I'm finished. I'm finished with competitive bodybuilding. I don't mean, I, I love to train, so I would always train. And I'd, I had a gym at that point, Temple Gym. So I was saying like, if it doesn't, competitive route doesn't go, then I need to put my time and focus, open some more gyms, something like that. Mm. Be involved, but be realistic. Uh, you can relax and enjoy your life a little bit more and spend more time with the family and everything like that. But that's the fortunately I got second and that's history. Being right? realistic though, that is something that a lot of delusional bodybuilders don't seem to have. It's like this dream and I've, I've been mates with so many of them, do you know yeah. what I mean? And you're thinking, you look at them and you think, not a chance, mate. Not well, it, a chance. it depends why why you started bodybuilding yeah. and why you wanted to build this physique. Mm. And a lot of the time, you, you, you're building armor. You're putting on a suit of armor and everybody will then treat you differently because yeah. you have some, you know, you look stronger, you look bigger. And everyone is then treating you a little bit different. You feel better, yeah? You can't then give that up. It's almost like addictive. Well, what if I go back to be that little skinny guy that you were or you think you were in your mind? Nobody will respect me anymore. Nobody loves me anymore or, or, you know, something like that. I think that's it. So people get caught in that mold. I call it being crystallized, you know. Um, a lot of people, just not bodybuilders, just a lot of people in life get to 30 or 40 years old and this is who I am and this is, this is it. Yeah, this is who I am. No, you you know, it's fluid, right? You should be always trying to learn more, mm -hmm. evolve more. Uh, that, that's why we're here, right? We're all here for an experience, to learn lessons, to to have experiences and, uh, and change. You're not here to go from here to here and back again and in a little, at least that's the way I look at it, you know? I wanted to, when I was a kid, I never felt like I fitted in. I, I'm at school and I knew this is more about indoctrination and, and training than it is about learning anything. And um, I feel like I'm different. I don't fit in and I want to do something. You know, bodybuilding came along and allowed me to do that. I, one of the things I wanted to do when I was younger is I want to travel the world as much as I can, see as many cultures and countries. And that. with bodybuilding allowed me to do that. I've been all around the world a few times. It's, you know, some places I haven't been yet, I still want to go, but uh, I never would have done that without, without bodybuilding. And, and, and that lack of insecurity that you have because you achieved your dreams of becoming Mr. Olympia and reached the top of the mountain and had all the adulation, that's probably why I'm assuming you don't care about having the same amount of muscle when you were in your prime because you proved your point, you achieved that, and now you're going to do something uh, else. Uh, physically, what I want now is to be functional, to be functional, to be healthy, uh, mobile, and, you know, want to look good to a certain degree, but... I, don't need a bodybuilder's physique. I need to be in shape, fairly lean. I've got some abs and, you know, look, look okay. And 59 years old. 59 years old. <laughs> with all due respect, fuck off. Come on, <laughs> give it a break. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. And uh, my, my, my camera guys here came with us hiking the other day. I said, mate, you was a rabbit. He stopped halfway up. <laughs> I said, mate, you was a rabbit. I said, what do you mean I was a rabbit? I said, me and my mate, another guy, he's the same age as me in his lifetime fitness. He used to do bodybuilding, now does wrestling. And every time I come to UK, we get together and we do a good hike, yeah? So I said, we get young guys like you, you know, in their 20s, and we send them up. And if we can pass them on the way, we're still doing okay. Mm. <laughs> so that's, that's how we gauge it, you know, we're doing all right. That was one question I have, because I don't really know that much about bodybuilding, but obviously, knowing Brian, I know little bits. But there's kind of, for someone who doesn't, look at it it's very easy to jump to the conclusion there's a lot of people standing on a stage with i'm i'm saying this honestly body dysmorphia or people who basically need to get too big or those kind of things well that, that there is a degree of that yeah because I, as i said it depends why you started bodybuilding uh when i was in the detention center when i was a teenager i already had the physique and when i post up my physique when i just started training a lot of people are oh, i'd like to look like that so i already had an athletic physique nice abs muscular you know not big like a big bodybuilder but a physique that a lot of people oh, i would like to look like that's a beach body i'd like to look like that so i wasn't starting thinking oh, i need to do this because i'm small or i'm weak or i don't have a good body i was doing it because this is a route to change my life that's that's what i had you know i had no education not because i was stupid i just well, after my father died i was before my father died, I guess I was doing quite well at school. But after that, I just, I just lost all interest. I Did you have no a good point. relationship with him? Um, 
Not particularly. My dad was not a guy that was at home very much. He was, you know, sometimes there, sometimes not there. But the thing is, he was my dad, yeah, and he was the male role model. I remember him teaching me to drive a car around the field when I was like 11 years old. So I was driving a car at 11 years old, but I didn't own one till I was 25 because I didn't have any money to get a car. Mm -hmm. right? I was bodybuilding, I was catching the bus everywhere all the time. So, you know, um, I wouldn't say it was super close, but it was my dad and, you know, everyone looks up to their dad, don't they? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so after that, I think I just lost interest. I didn't see the point and I just <coughs> knew that school was like, something's wrong here, <laughs> you know, and now I know something's wrong. It's, uh, you're not really learning anything that useful at school. It's more about training to be there from nine to four because that's how you're going to fit in with society. They just give you enough... Um, you know, to be a functional worker, basically. Uh, don't teach you about anything useful like what's money, where does it come from, how do you manage it, or, you know, things like practical things like that you don't learn at school. Mm. So, um, yeah, I didn't feel like I fitted in. I wasn't interested in doing their exams and stuff. Um, so I don't have, you know, paperwork from school that would allow me to get a good job or something like that, and then I ended up in a jail. And I know a lot of people that be in and out for the rest of their life so I could have gone that route or I could have gone the bodybuilding mm. route and uh, I, I knew that initial taste of being in that place I was like I don't ever want to come back here again I'm, I'm a free spirit and I feel you know you become a number right one thing that always kind of fascinates me and that you we were talking about earlier as well is um, how trends are set within bodybuilding and what I don't quite understand when I'm looking at it as a novice or whatever yeah. you want to call it what makes a good aesthetic? Um, well, it's a combination of factors to make um, a championship bodybuilder. So a lot of people say to me, oh, look at this guy, this is a big lad, he'll make a good bodybuilder. Not necessarily so. Um, to be a good bodybuilder, first you need the skeletal structure. That's your, you know, that's the frame of the building, right? That you can't change. So you need relatively wide clavicles, to narrower hips preferably it looks more aesthetic and you'll note that a lot of, you'll see this in a lot of the champions the leg length to torso the legs are usually a bit longer because that looks more aesthetic with the longer legs and it gives more you know uh taper more v-shape to the um, to the upper body are there certain measurements that you would look for like were you like well if you're a 28 inch waist or a 13 inch waist that's that's good or are you it's basically not so much about measurements it's more like what what it looks like so mm -hmm. you've got the frame and then you need to build you need to have the potential and then you need to do it to have proportionate uh muscle mass there's even a champion body will have some areas that are a little bit weaker than other areas everyone has that um but generally speaking, um, so you have a length of muscle bellies all over your body, and that's genetically determined. So some people would have a bicep that goes from here all the way down right to the, you know, right, right all the way down to here. So the longer the muscle belly, the more potential it has for, for growth. So you'll be looking for somebody with that frame with, um, you know, proportionate um, muscle bellies and also the ability to to get very lean is somewhat genetic as well right uh, i've got very th thin skin always been lean my kids are the same my kids even before they my son my daughter no training they got abdominals and that, that's somewhat genetic a lot so, of people must really dislike your family for that yeah, exactly yeah. That. i've that's, seen your son yeah. and like yeah the, and he it's crap. very similar to you <laughs> he's really? a lot of crap uh, right. uh, <laughs> he's, always, he's, almost, he's probably naturally leaner than me he's not as big as me but he's naturally even leaner mm. than me he's literally looks a couple of weeks away from contest shape without trying at all for those who don't know there's like uh, is it seven poses you get judged on there's uh, seven compulsory poses uh, oh. you know the double bicep the lat spread all that kind of stuff oh. there's seven of those freestyle uh, and then there's four relaxed poses or strictly semi-relaxed poses yeah. from the front from the side from the back so you see all angles oh. in a relaxed state and then you see all these poses seven compulsory poses some from the front some from the side some from the back so again you see all the muscles when when they're posing so everyone has to do this why they're comp called compulsory obviously and you compare 
Mr. A to Mr. B and C. And what are you comparing when you, because when I'm looking at them, you know, it's the same as when I first started watching fighting. I was a bit like, great, you hit him in the face really well there. It's similar with this where it's like, great, you've got muscle, he's got muscle. Yeah. To, to, the, to the layman, it doesn't look all that similar, but I do understand there's lots of nuance. Maybe, so let's say me and you are competing, but you're better than me in three poses. Thank you. You could be 10 times better than me in three poses, but I beat you in four. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how badly you beat me in those three. You still only won three. It's like, I don't know, like rounds in boxing or something. But I won four, so I'll, I'll be the winner. So they're looking for the best guy in each pose, and it's a combination of proportions, size, and conditioning. It's like if you've got all those and put them in a pot and mix them together, that's what you're looking for. And, and to my knowledge, like to come out of nowhere as you did and to get second in your first Olympia was very unheard of. At that point, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, it. like people like uh, Ronnie Coleman, Jay Cutler, so many other big bodybuilders took years to climb yeah. the ladder, whereas you just rocketed top two immediately. And then the guy who you pushed for the title was like, right, that's enough of that then. And well, he, he cleared was, off. We won eight titles. So, yeah. I mean, at that point, he held the record. Uh, nothing too much to gain and everything to lose if you go you know next year yeah. I could have beaten them so. and he knew you were just starting w within that within that then what are the conversations like backstage or what are the relationships like backstage because I think a lot of people get an insight into Miss World or something like that where it's considered to be this really catty environment everyone's sort of like look at her hair or whatever mm -hmm. it, is, is it comparable in, in the men's what's the competition like it's a little bit like that well you know guys can be a little friendly as well but I wasn't <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would be polite and friendly if I see you, uh, like normally. But if we're backstage, I'm not talking to you. I'm, I'm just focused. I'm not your friend at this point in time. I'm here to, to win, here to get the trophy and the check. And, uh, you know, afterwards, I'll... So I used to um, be the last one to take off my uh, tracksuit backstage. So I'll be playing little mind games because I know everyone's waiting to see you know so let them wait God, could you yeah, feel the eyes yeah, on yeah let them wait so <laughs> so you're not really thinking about what you're going to do on stage and how you, you, you're looking at me mm -hmm. your energy is being taken by me mm -hmm. so I'll do that Lee Haney did it to me I remember uh, he, he, he said in a podcast that he used to do this he said I did it to Dorian but I don't know if it affected him or not but it did it did a little bit it took the wind he, out your sails a bit I was here he was over there and you know I was just happened to look up and he just took his tracksuit off and got his back out you know and his back was super thick I was like oh shit <laughs> you know, so I remember that so I, I you know I always used to do that to the guys backstage not really you know if they say hello to me I say hello but that would be it the pinnacle or what a lot of people felt like the pinnacle of bodybuilding even was was that 1993 era where you put out those black and white photographs. Uh, how, how long ago was that? Uh, sorry, how that, long that before was, the show um, was it? This was uh, Kevin Horton again. Mm. It was like uh, six weeks he before came the show down, I said, can you come down and take some pictures? Because I got some from last year that you took in the gym. I want to stand in the same spot in the gym, the same lights and everything. So I've got, I used to do them at home, you know, every week take pictures, getting ready for a contest and go to Boots and mm. wait for them to be developed and all this stuff. Um, so I said, come down. I want you to take the pictures in the same spot that it took last year. It took him a week after the contest. So I was in shape and I want to see how compare. So it was just for my reference, really. He said, mate, I've developed them photos. I said, yeah, how do they look? He said, I'm going to bring them down to you. You're not going to believe this. And from the year before, you know, the two years back to back, it's, it's crazy, the difference. And um, he said, I'm going to send them to the magazine, to Flex magazine. That wasn't the original plan. It was just, just for me. That's why I still got my socks on, if you look. Because I just finished training, took off my top, took off the bottoms, left the socks on, which is a good thing because the floor in Temple Gym was disgusting, dirty anyway. <laughs> so, um, And he sent them to the magazine. Weeder put them in the magazine. And by the way, Weeder didn't like the pictures. He didn't get it. He's like, ah, it's not the correct lighting and the shadows. And I said, Joe, nobody gives a shit about that. Watch. And they became like, most iconic pictures of myself ever, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely those black and white so, pictures. Was, did, so they were six that, weeks out from 93, yeah. And that made, did that make the magazine before the Olympia? Did people know that that was what was going to show up? I think it came out just around the time of the contest. But the thing was, uh, Peter McGough was the editor of Flex magazine. He was British and he was 
writing for a small British magazine when I became novice. And our careers went almost parallel. Oh, yeah. So Peter McGough was a friend and he was the editor of Flex magazine. And all the guys that used to train in Venice, California, they used to go to the weeder offices just, to, you know, just to be there and show their faces and talk to the, the writers and go to see Joe and all that stuff. So they're always popping in. So Peter, he said, when they come in, he said, um, have you seen the pictures of Dorian? No, 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 we've got them. What does it, it look like? I said, I'd casually just drop them on the table and watch the face just drop, like demoralized. Uh, from that point, everyone was looking to get second place and that was first for them. So yeah. they, they already mentally were beaten before the contest. Not that it mattered because physically they were going to get beaten as well. Yeah, they'd never seen anyone as in condition with that kind of mass. Yeah. You know, I don't know what you weighed on stage that year, but it must have weighed been. on stage about actually those black and white photos. I was about two seventy something, so like, I Jesus. don't know what that is, nineteen and something, nineteen and a half stone or something. And on stage, I was uh, two fifty seven, two fifty eight. So um, a lot of people like that physique that I had with the black and white because it's bigger and fuller. But I wanted to be super shredded as well, so I always used to sacrifice a little size and fullness to get that yeah. uh, shape as well but even on stage it was you know nobody had seen that before really and, and what Haney had, what was he like a 240 guy and you yeah, took 245 something like that yeah. so we've gone up another 10 12 pounds and leaner you know lean yeah. lean muscle tissue same height so it, you know that was accepted they called me the game changer from that point because it was before Dorian and after Dorian mm. whether that's a good or a bad thing or that I said that to you before in my mind. Mind. Yeah. <laughs> because a lot of people were trying to get big like myself and Ronnie Common who, who followed me was even bigger a lot of people trying to achieve that but they're not putting the work that you know they, they're getting the body weight they're getting the size but it's not the same it's not the same yeah quality. and you see today's bodybuilders have size or even for the last 15 years the size has been there but the conditioning it's not been there at all no because to get that kind of condition and you've got to come down in, in the body weight and lose some of that size which mm. they don't want to do now and it's kind of I guess the standard now is not so high so you know nobody needs to really do that I mean mm. you, you can tell now when I went to a com competition back then even the guys with a tracksuit on zipped up to their chin I would know who's in shape how by the face because the face will be super drawn you will see the muscles in the side of the jaw the face will be sunken in that guy's you can see he's in shape but mm -hmm. now the guy's round and happy and you know. <laughs> <laughs> round and happy yeah yeah, yeah they're smiling we were well smiling. the bellies are round as well because they've got those sort of distended uh, yeah gut. this is from uh, nobody really knows exactly what that is but I started using insulin as an anabolic 96 97 the last two years i was competing um and my stomach just started to get a little bit distended so mm. i think this is this is the cause is that, is that called bubble gut yeah in, insulin's a strange one uh, from what i from what i understand about it, because obviously it's a diabetic drug that and i'm, I'm guessing what uh, you guys were doing was trying to get your body to absorb more nutrients and more of the Insulin, um, in a way, is an anabolic hormone. So if okay. you mix it with growth hormone and steroids, theoretically, it it you know it works in an anabolic uh -huh. way. But uh, I tell people that I coach and uh, help now and advise. I say, look, oh, I'm always honest. I tell you the truth. Yes, I used insulin. Was it a positive in my mind? No, it wasn't, because you'd start to lose a little bit of the quality, uh -huh. and uh, not to mention the negative health effects. You know, diabetics that use insulin, I think they have like. 10 years less life expectancy. Wow. So if you're using insulin and steroids and other things all together, this is yeah. becoming a ticking time bomb. Over yeah, there's a lot of the older you get, The it. older you get, the more, the less that, you know, let's say when I was 20 years old, yeah, I could go out and get totally hammered, pissed, drink a bottle of vodka, and the next day I'd probably be all right, or the day after that I'd be fine. If I did it now, I'd be destroyed or wouldn't yeah. I'd be a week yeah so your body can't tolerate this kind of stress as you get older yeah um so we're seeing a lot of heart attacks and and stuff with bodybuilders now in the 40s and 50s I mean it's it's happened always since the 90s there's been a few guys Mike Maserato that competed against me had a triple bypass at 38 and died at 48 so it you know it's there 
But it's getting more and more frequent now, I think. Yeah, I wrote down a few names that I, I wanted to bring up because it, it feels like, well, especially... I got a list of 50. When I, I did a podcast last week with wow. this medical expert and there's 50 pros that I know about. That's just pros. That have died. What about amateurs? What about wow. guys that never compete? Well, yeah, like, um, I don't know if you know this guy, but um, back in the 90s, there was a guy called Andy Hornby. Yeah, British guy. Competed against him in the British Championship 1998. He was... Uh, Light heavyweight, I think. Yeah, my champion. dad. Well, he was my dad's best friend, actually. But my dad always said, like, this it's a young guy, guy wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was twenty, early twenties. He died backstage or something, I think, uh, because of the dehydration. Yeah. That's the, that's diuretic use. Yeah, uh, some guys and girls use diuretics to lose body water, mm. uh, and you lose a lot of electrolytes. Electrolytes regulate your heartbeat, so mm. if they get really out of whack, uh, Mohammed Ben Aziza that beat me in my first pro show he died on a european tour um from basically his whole body started cramping up including his heart and he had a heart attack in the very early 30s i think so this this process that you guys go through i don't think people understand who see it on stage they just think you know you inject steroids you get on stage but like there's the obviously there's the bulking and you change drugs you take you take cutting drugs i guess that are different and then um, then if you're in using, I don't know if insulin is a part of that, but the fact that you then have to take all of the water out of your body. And uh, I went to a bodybuilding contest once and I seen this kid, like he, he was like lying there before getting on stage, just drained. No energy, and it, yeah. he was getting like these Lucasade tablets and a shot of whiskey before he went on stage. And I'm like, this is absolutely mental. This, um, Like, what is that process like doing all these well, because Lawrence was I, asking me about trend before we came on, and I'm yeah. like, I, trend's almost a whole other thing now. What is what yeah. is that even? Trenbolone's a anabolic steroid that um, see a lot, a lot of anabolic steroids aromatize. What that means is um, because estrogen, which is a female hormone, and testosterone, which is a male hormone, they're, they're fairly similar. Yeah, mm. so if you're put in testosterone from outside and so your levels are going right up male hormone levels your body can actually convert some of that to estrogen so the estrogen comes up as well so it's trying to keep a bit of a balance right but not all steroids do that some of them don't aromatize to estrogen uh trembolone being being one of them is that considered a, a positive or a negative because no, it's considered to be a positive before a contest because if your estrogen levels are high you tend to hold more body fat and more water, be right. a bit softer, right? It's a female hormone. Mm -hmm. um, so Trembolone, we were using that in a form called Parab Parabolone. Um, came in from France in 76 milligrams. And I'd probably use two of those a week. Two or three a week was like accepted back then that that would be the maximum. So around 200 milligrams uh, because it's quite powerful and potentially a little bit toxic uh, guys are coming to me now they don't even compete and they say I'm on 800 milligrams of trend I'm like where did you get this where did you get this information from like it's it's crazy mm. but you know the internet is a source of information which information is good but you got a lot of information well, that's what we and were talking about. Not all we of it's good, a lot of it's bad. Yeah, we were talking about this before, weren't we? Because part of the part of my research, I ended up on TikTok. Uh, and no one ever <laughs> wants to say that when they're doing research. But the, but the point with that was that there was a guy on um, TikTok who was basically, he's a bodybuilder and he had his own bodybuilding account. And I, I think he hadn't, you know, he wasn't particularly famous, but he was saying he was kind of beyond his peak. And now it was time for him to come clean about a couple of things and one of them was about trend and he said he had a, a gyno problem and these kind of things as a, as a i guess as a, a, a side effect of that and that it came with a lot of side effects and he felt that the, there was a lot of people on tiktok instagram all these places just advocating for the use of this stuff not really talking responsibly about it and he said it really concerned him because i mean yeah i think uh, each generation of bodybuilders are pushing the chemical envelope a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. It certainly looks that way on stage. Yeah, and, and what, you know, what <coughs> I'm told by people that compete or even don't compete, they're just taking it recreationally. They're taking, uh, I'm saying, mate, you're taking more than I took from Mr. Olympia. So I don't think you need that. And uh, recreation, you know, you, you, just is it, you're getting the benefit that you want, the recovery, the muscle building. Right. With trying to minimize the negative effects. And 
there is going to be a certain point where you're not really getting any more positive effects anyway. Mm. It's like a glass of water. Once it's full, it's full. You can't use it. It's just spilling over then. So then you just put more stress on your body for no benefit. Is that placebo almost then for some people? Um, I think so. And then they're, they're holding more water. It's not really muscle. That's why the physiques are looking softer. But now. to someone like me, an everyday person, if someone's holding more water, I'm like, fucking hell, you look good. Like, we don't really know the difference well, out know, on the street. I, I get a lot of people asking me for advice. And I always say to them, like, me personally, my advice to you, unless you're competing, don't take any steroids. Unless you're like past 40 and your testosterone is low and that's hormone replacement. That's a different story. That's, that's good <laughs> yeah. for your health. If your testosterone is low and you put it back to, you know, optimal yeah. levels, optimal where you would be when you're 25, 30 and you're like 45, 50 years old, it has tremendous health benefits. But at super high levels, it's not. You that, know? That's an interesting angle as well, the testosterone replacement therapy. Yeah. Um, would, like men have this period of their life where things stop working as well as they used to and, and things like uh, people call it a midlife crisis but often it is just like when your hormone levels are out of whack and you've been used to a certain level of pep in your step I guess yeah. um, you're not feeling as good so that, that's where it can really help men it's feel not, like it's themselves not just, it's not that you're just not feeling so good um, depression I guess as well depression mm. arthritis diabetes heart problems mm. all these things can be improved by taking uh, you know testosterone replacement amount mm. so in that context is very healthy for people there's, uh, there's a book that i read it was in french at first now it's in english ageless man and there's a french doctor in there that's been prescribing testosterone and other androgens for for decades and it's got all the case mm. studies of all the you know uh health problems that people had that it was basically able to fix with testosterone but testosterone is no profit in it for drug companies so they'd rather you take some arthritis drugs and some insulin and some antidepressants and some this and some that. Viagra you know all that stuff <laughs> together yeah, yeah. It's, it's more profitable for you them see, you so see when guys get older though like they no offense to any of the elderly men out there, but you know, you are. A sh I mean, you're speaking to someone who's almost sixty. No, but, he, but I'm not talking about Dorian. Well, I don't feel like I'm sixty. Yeah, exactly. Oh, That's yeah. what I was about to say. Yeah. You know, when you see those guys who are getting older, the man boobs are coming in, yeah. things aren't like, and they can't be bothered to get out of bed and do the same thing. So lack they used of motivation. To. Yeah, yeah, and a bit of. Uh, you know, testosterone in them, it would change the game. But it, like you say, it isn't advertised by the companies who can make money off of it because it's yeah you got maybe you'd have to go to a private clinic or something yeah. even your gp is going to probably frown upon it and say no 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 you don't need it yeah even if you're you know there's a there's a parameters right your testosterone should be between whatever 200 and 1000 uh -huh. so if it's 201 i'm okay and you won't prescribe it to me i gotta be 199 and then you'll give it to me so uh -huh. if you're 200 or 250 or 300 it's not optimal uh -huh. you know you're not functioning optimally you want to be up near the uh, the top of the range uh -huh. um and there's this bit of a stigma about it because it's a male hormone testosterone uh -huh. steroids bodybuilders but women are on hormone replacement and they're you know improving their quality of life with that um, it's this idea that it's cheating and it's like well not you're not we're not cheating anyone if we do this later on in life as men. It's, it well, you're just be having fine. a better quality of life yeah. and a better health. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Is it cheating taking insulin? Is it cheating mm. taking thyroid if your thyroid's not working? You're not producing enough testosterone. So, Do you still take any? Yeah, like, I take replacement yeah. uh, therapy. If I don't, it'll be too low because, I mean, it happens anyway to, to men as they get older. Uh -huh. But my, I accelerated mine because I was taking steroids for bodybuilding. So right. this suppresses your own levels. And it's hard to get them to bounce back after using it for years. Because I'm looking at you at 60 years old thinking, bloody hell, I wonder what he's doing. Do you yeah. know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, but I mean, testosterone placement is just part of it. I've got mm. a whole regime for my health. I do um, breathing exercises. I do meditation. I do stretching. I do cardio exercise. I go in the sun. I walk barefoot on the floor. Like So many things I do to look after myself because I did this sport, which is what I wanted to do and I don't have any regrets or anything like that but it was hard on my body so now I'm being kind, kind. to my body you know it's, it's a very extreme lifestyle and now I feel like I'm more balanced I'm balancing everything rather than being in this extreme 
mode. When did you feel more in touch with your body? After I started doing psychedelics. I did psychedelics and I got messages when I did it. It's the like, best answer I think like I've ever your, uh, your body's a bit messed up, mate. You've battered it about and you need to straighten it out and be more kind to it. And uh, I, I remember going to the chiropractor or osteopath, I'm not sure, in Spain. I was going like probably twice a month for an adjustment because it was a bit tight here, a bit tight there and all that. And, uh, and I had this vision like you need to do something different maybe yoga or something and then I went to see him and he's like you ever tried yoga I said no it's funny you say that because I've been thinking about it it's he, not funny he never, he never saw me since that day I've never been back to see him because I don't need to go mm -hmm. anymore because I did this I did yoga and it was like really what imagine I, I couldn't even stand on one foot without like wobbling and falling over because I had no balance I never trained for balance I trained for power you're squatting, you're deadlifting, your leg, two legs and you're pushing. It's all power, so it was challenging. And all my fascia around my hips and my back and everything was super tight because it bloody needed to be to hold me together in all, you know, all that, that kind of training. And uh, I remember I was doing yoga and stretching and they say, you know, yoga, just go to your limit and don't push. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's inside me, isn't it, to push a little bit. So I would feel like my fascia was burning, like I was on fire, even I was feeling like nauseous and stuff. Uh, after a while, it just got looser and softer and I was able to, I couldn't even turn. When I drove my car, I used to look in the mirror uh, instead of like turning, because I couldn't, I couldn't turn. So that's, I'm like, I need my body for what I need now. I'm like, this yeah. is the only vehicle you've got to experience your life in, yeah, and if it's, if you're in pain and you can't really function properly, it's your quality of life goes down. And, and we're, yeah, we've kind of skipped ahead because you you probably were in a lot of pain post bodybuilding because of what you eventually the injuries that you come up against in bodybuilding as well. Well, I wasn't in a lot of pain. I um, I had a bicep tear and a tricep tendon tear during my career, oh. so that that they were injured, but they were healed and they're a bit weak. Um, and my left shoulder was a bit injured. Uh, I guess the tendons were a bit frayed and damaged mm -hmm. uh, from all this super heavy training. And then I was doing some MMA with some friends of mine and wrestling and I fell on my shoulder and just snapped the, the, the rotor cuff. And I had two surgeries to try and fix it and it wouldn't fix. So I said, okay, that's it. It doesn't hurt me. Mm -hmm. um, it's just very weak. I can't do any kind of pushing or overhead stuff. It's very weak. Um, so I guess it was made it was partially damaged from my career and then I finished it off doing something else. <laughs> and uh, a year ago, I was mountain biking, fell off my mountain bike and I must have put my hand out to catch the fall and it totally dislocated this shoulder, tore tendons, I tore ligaments and uh, they wanted to do surgery on it. But I said, I'm not, I had surgery before, it's painful, it's time out, I don't want to do it. Um, so I've just rehabbed it and strengthened it as much as I can. So I've got injuries which are a bit limited and if I want to, you know, if I wanted to train heavy, I can't do it. You know, I still like to train a bit heavy, but I can't and I accept it. But I can do everything else. You know, I can swim, I can do yoga, I can do Pilates, biking, whatever, and light training and cardio. So it's all I need now. I'm not really in pain. I was just a bit like, not severe pain, but I had tightness in my back and things like that. And a tightness in my hips. I remember having a conversation with the osteopath and he said, you know, when men were more primitive and women, used to sit in the squat all the time. You know, women used to wash, if you look at India, they'd sit in a squat and wash the clothes by the river and all that. Guys would sit around a campfire in a squat and all that. And I was thinking, oh, I used to squat four or 500 pounds with my ass on the floor, I'm sure I can. And I got down into a squat and I was like, oh, it's all tight and everything. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. So I need to work on that. So uh, my body is just more functional now. How old were you when you had your last bodybuilding contest? Uh, I was 35. So I retired when I was 36. Um, it's young, isn't it? It's a young man's sport. Most oh. sports are. You put your body under a lot of stress. Um, so guys are competing a bit older now. A lot of them are actually. Yeah. yeah, a lot of them in their like forties and still. Well, obviously there was Sean Roden who won Mr. Olympia 45, 44, and he died at forty six. Yeah. That must have been a, a bit of a shock in the community when someone so recently the world champion is. It's dead. a shock because he's a Mr. Olympia, mm. right? Um, and there was a guy, I'm oh, sorry, I can't remember his second name, from New York, George. He died in the hotel before the contest. Wow. 
so it was like uh, you know double whammy uh. but there is you know uh, the bodybuilding lifestyle and the drug taking and everything affects your vascular system and the viscosity of the blood and everything and then there's something else around now I don't know if I can mention it but yeah you can mention you know, anything you want uh, you know this one that people are doing I don't want to say it because I don't want to get this thing pulled or sure, anything sure right I understand what you're saying yeah, yeah. right okay. yeah but uh-huh. this also you, does you get the, it twice the, the V oh right yeah if you're not if you're not V'd if you've not got your V card yeah um, we can go down a rabbit hole with that um, maybe at some point but yeah. uh, you know you got 110 105 FIFA football players that have collapsed on the pitch fit young guys after the thing oh, yeah right. um, it is that true I've, coagulates wow, the blood yeah wow. uh, rugby players football players athletes dropping yeah, like I, flies I've seen, a, I've seen a report of like um, how many people had uh, died in America within like you know a short time after having it yeah um, but obviously it doesn't fit the narrative to report on that right now for no but it's coming out now the CDC are basically saying oops we're sorry all those COVID uh, deaths that we yeah. put down to COVID you know what 90% was already dying from something else uh-huh. so that's coming out WHO now admitting that COVID is no more dangerous than a normal flu that we get every year. There's no more deaths than we have every year. So it's a huge, uh, it's a huge scam, and it's. I don't think this truth is going to be able to be stopped coming out. The media's doing their best to not cover it, but it's leaking out. Now. Yeah, uh, well, we're recording this on a day where Boris Johnson's bringing in um, new. Uh, restrictions or whatever and the, uh, within a week of uh, it all coming out that Is they it, were having parties last Christmas well yeah that's true because uh, uh, well, so they, they know right you know they'll wear the masks in public but in private they won't yeah there's a the video of that girl laughing know, about it first of all the virus is not that dangerous and secondly the mask does fuck all anyway mm. apart from make it worse because you're breathing in your own toxins so you people are getting pneumonia and stuff because they're wearing these dirty masks all day and they're not breathing properly people uh-huh. are forced to wear masks now to work yeah. to go to work they don't have any choice if they want to keep the job they've got to all day wear this mask and these blue masks that everyone's wearing go check out the big box that the little boxes come in on the side of the box it says this will not protect you from any virus including coronavirus and you're all wearing them yeah. mm. it tells you Mm, sure. you know? Well, I, I mean, the must K- have Kamala always Kamala Harris, sort of, it is, you know, the Kamala second Harris, yeah. uh, vice in charge president after the senile guy. Um, she, I just saw a video today and she's saying, she's telling people, but they still don't get it. 85% of the people now in the hospital with COVID are vaccinated. So it doesn't protect you from anything, it's likely to make you sicker. Interesting. So it, it, this is coming from the, you know, their own mouths I mean I think the, the the lack of belief in the government is finally starting to get to that point now where the regular people who followed all the rules and haven't been sceptical from the start are now at that point I think a lot of people like you probably from the get go were sceptical I know oh, I, I knew I knew what was going on from day one because yeah. I knew that this uh, new world order globalist plan I mean I've known about it for 20 years since I met David Icke in Birmingham you know so how did you so um b- before you met david ike were you kind of already uh into in for that uh, I, I already epistemology? sense that things are not right right but i didn't know exactly the way the world works with the you know secret societies and families controlling uh mostly everything i right. learned that long time ago and i learned what the ultimate end goal is is to have a one world system a one world government army uh, digital, basically a technological form of communism. Right, okay. Uh, that's the plan for us to have no freedoms, no freedom of movement and uh, finances and so on. And also uh, to dr- dr- dramatically reduce the world population. When you say communism, what you mean is kind of, a, um, because I, I don't know that much about this, you mean kind of dysfunctional communism that we saw before, sort of some people at the top creaming off 
and everyone else sort of yes um, that's how it is that's how it as works, workers right? as, as you that, put it yeah. and surprisingly right. though i think it's it, what what i've learned in the last couple of years is how easy that is to actually put in place i always thought <coughs> when i was listening to david Icke or any any conspiracy uh, theorist um the thing is that where does that term come from conspiracy well, theorist yeah mm-hmm. uh, there's actually not okay. theories are provable facts well, most there, of these things i mean the problem with david Icke, obviously you it know can make I mean? it publicly very difficult i think to to have um, sort of a reasoned debate in, uh, you know, mainstream I don't think he's areas. No, 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 in nobody's, areas. Nobody's right on anything. And David Dyke's just a researcher. He uh, researches, yeah. There's uh-huh. a lot of people out there. That I think that. he makes jumps, though, and, and that's the thing. What I'm saying is, I'm not saying. Look, I've, 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 we've had him on the podcast, and when he did 9/11. I couldn't argue with the word. Just to be he clear, said. David David Dyke didn't do 9/11. <laughs> it, was, it was someone else, but you know. He, he but the point it, is, yeah. is. There's certain jumps he makes, and especially when COVID hit and he was putting <coughs> it down to um, the the telephone change. Um, the 5G. Yeah. Right. Uh, I've, I've, very, I've basic that. The I've, telephone change, uh, yeah. But, but um, this is the thing is, a lot of the things David Icke said back in the day, as much as he might have come up with things I don't agree with, this vaccine passport and all of that, it is one step closer to... A, like that inevitable ID card and um, and what the the thing he D- digital like digital control yeah. so the the idea is that all your financial records medical records travel all that will be digital mm. and within your Trackable. within yourself right. within your body and one of his theories that um, was the totalitarian tiptoe about how y- you know you can't get a pu- um, a, the public to you know buy into everything immediately you've got to have an end goal and you've got to uh, baby feed them you know like small steps that's, at one time and get them there and i do feel like happened. in this that's last two happening. years i have been i always wondered when i went back and watched the 9-11 documentaries about you know was it a controlled demolition and all of that and I, I you know i believe that there was there was some shady shit going on around it um and i've always i've always wondered like would i spot when something like that happened as an adult and now this has happened the last two years i'm not saying that covid is um something fictional that, yeah it's certainly a real thing in my opinion but what i mean is the the government have used it to their own benefit clearly to gain as much power as possible and they do it just like they did for 9 11 they do it in the name of the disaster yeah but the problem is is when the when the when the event is over they never give back the power. That's absolutely it, they, how it it's works. A, it's a land That's grab. It and we're in a position now where there are people in Australia being put into uh, COVID camps. There are, uh, in Germany, there are people being arrested on the street for not having a COVID and passport. And if you told people this would happen 10 years ago, they would say you're crazy. Uh, Part point. of the reason it's happening is on a spiritual level because a lot of people are waking up now. A lot of people are questioning things where before they didn't. Mm. And it's a time in human evolution where people are going to wake up and become more aware and realize uh, the system's not to their benefit. So they've got to kind of shut that down before it gets too much momentum. And this was something that 20 years ago you sort of took an interest in. Uh, is that something you've kind of... Was there a moment though? Right. Like I, I think uh, I had a crisis when I kind of finished bodybuilding because that's all I did. That's all I knew. That's all my energy going into that. And then shit what I'm going to do now it wasn't even planned my retirement because I did it with an injury and some things happened in my personal life as well I lost somebody very close to me and I got divorced a lot of stuff was going on it just made me question everything so I started reading and thinking and studying everything and I came across I came across a lot of uh, stuff that were really eye-opening and like wow the world is not the way I thought it was were you um were you always spiritual were you always someone uh who kind of question things like that or is there no, not really much space always, for that when you're I've always been somebody that is hard to control and always asking questions and not following but within that is there a spiritual element to to you around that? do you think there's always been there or is that something you've nurtured after bodybuilding yeah, it's, it's been nurtured but I think everybody's got it inside of them um, I, I, wonder. I think we're all aware that's something bigger than the physical world that we're perceiving and picking up there's something outside of that right. whether you want to call it god or universe or whatever you want to call it what do what do you would you put a, a word on that i guess i don't really like the word god because i associate it with them when i was at school and you tell you there's this guy up in the sky is going to punish you if you don't do 
what right. they want you to do basically yeah. uh, so maybe it's a bit of a negative I still feel with that so I just call it you know the the universe Purpose whatever or, yeah, like, sure. you know we're all part of it and from psychedelics I learned this clearly that everything's everything it's all we're all part you know we're all we're all part of it because that's what you were talking about is I have you you've done ayahuasca and done the ceremony for that as well yeah, I have, yeah. Where, where did you uh where did you do I that? did it in Spain initially and then uh you know I told uh Brian Rose on London Real about it and we did the podcast and it was very popular and then he went to try it at this place out in Costa Rica Soltara and they got in touch with me and said anytime you want to come out here and do you know do the ceremonies at this place uh, you're welcome to come out and I said thank you and then they called me back and they said you know what we had another idea instead of you coming to do it why don't you come out and headline a camp and Dorian Yates ayahuasca camp and we get people from the fitness industry and stuff like that or you know that follow you that could be also interested um, so we've put three com camps on out there so far like 20 people in the group and uh, I guess people came that maybe were curious but thinking maybe it's not for me because that's maybe some far out hippie stuff and I'm a bodybuilder or I'm in from mm -hmm. the gym but hey I'm, I'm curious about it and Dorian's doing it so they right. came because of that and I've seen you know people literally change their lives for, for the better from I, a, from I, I a know week a guy, out there I know a guy who's like as blokey as a guy can get right like um, he come into my gym and he told me he was going to do this um, DMT trip and he, he come back and he went Brian you're not going to believe it and like he was like he had this different look different complete attitude yeah. and he was like I just I've cried and I've cried and he, he went back to his girlfriend and he was like I'm so sorry for the way I've been treating yeah. you he stopped smoking he, 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 he said I, I, I spoke to God or whatever it was and and like this is a guy who's like the last person I ever expected to have an epiphany and like yeah. all of a sudden he's coming up with all this and more like he's literally tears running down his eyes when he's talking about this experience he had and that was when I was like bloody hell if I can save you yeah. like you, you <laughs> I want to try this one day you will be changed and you will see everything from a different perspective what was your experience like then every time it's a little bit different but that was the main thing I mean uh, my first experience I was laughing because I was like wow this is it this like it's like I knew everything I couldn't the thing is you can't retain all of it with DMT is very quick well ayahuasca is DMT but it's mixed with another compound so it lasts for hours so it's kind of slower you get a bit more from it um, but with the uh, with DMT I saw like everything's one thing it's all connected and this life is just a little dream and don't take it seriously and I was literally pissing myself laughing like that's it you bastards and I've been getting stressed and worried and it's all just a little game and you never die you just you know just playing a role now and then, then you go somewhere else and um, you know I still forget that sometimes because I'm here I'm doing this um, you know so sometimes I still can you know think this is like all there is and it's real and get stressed and everything but uh, yeah, it gives you a different perspective on things. So ju just, um, uh, I'm really curious about how these things work. So um, you invite people out and then when, when you're doing, wh what does the ceremony entail? Because people call it a ceremony. I kind yeah. of have this idea yeah. of, I think a lot of people probably go headdresses, full garb, but I don't know if that's reality. Well, what it is, um, first, when you get there, there's like some initiations, like they, they tell you about the plan and what to expect and all, the, which is great, and how to like integrate this, how to handle it when you go home, because I didn't really know that, and I was like, wanted to tell everybody, <laughs> and they just can't relate to what, you, what you're telling them. They just think, oh, yeah, okay, mate, you, you know, you went in the jungle, you took some drugs and you hallucinated. No, just like I'm a celebrity. I, I was there, I was like, I really, this really happened to me, and... Uh, so you have to be careful how much you tell people because otherwise right. they, they doubt you. And when you, you, when you see yeah. their doubt, they don't even need to say anything like just the face, right? And then you start to think, oh, was it, did I really have that experience? Right. Um, so anyway, the ceremony itself um, is like, I attract people there and I maybe have a little chat with them or something when we're there. Um, but the ceremony has nothing to do with me because I'm not a shaman, yeah? I, I go in there as a, you know as a student like everybody else 
uh, and you have a meeting with the shaman before the ceremonies to say, hey, this is me, and this is why I'm here, this is what I'm going to work on, and, you know, they keep that in mind when they do the ceremonies. And uh, you go in, and uh, you have your place, like a, you know, like a mattress or something, where you can, you're going to sit, and you go up one at a time and you, you take the drink the medicine and you sit down and you wait for the effects to start, start. and then the shamans take over they start to, uh, these particular shamans are from the Shipibo tribe and they do Ikaros I think I hope I'm pronouncing it right basically they're songs they're spiritual songs so they'll see you and they'll read you know once they're in they take the, the plant medicine themselves so the plant ayahuasca is not just hey, you're taking a drug it's some kind of intelligence that i really way more intelligent than us who knows who you are it knows why you're there it knows what you need to learn and uh, the shaman kind of works with that energy and he'll sing songs for you but they're for you for your situation and then they go to brian and it'll be helping Brian with his situation often you throw up you might shit yourself <laughs> I heard people pissing themselves laughing I've heard people crying I heard women having orgasms <laughs> so all kind of stuff is going yeah, well, on is, up, lost. is it sorry but is this all at the same time in a room then yeah, what, what right, a room. yeah okay. we're all in the room together and is that and do you they must have good cleaning stuff they genuinely are they are you conscious of the other people in that moment or are you um yeah you can kind of come in and out of it you can hear stuff going on um but within your own experience as well and you can close your eyes or open your eyes and you see a lot of symbolism basically which is the structure of reality is made up from numbers uh, I don't know if you heard of the Fibonacci sequence but you know mm -hmm. starts with one one and two and it's within all structures of everything you see a lot of numbers and shapes and colors and messages and uh, every experience is different and every individual's experience is different and it's frustratingly hard to describe yeah you no know, you d I think you've done a good job though I'm yeah. trying but it's an impossible task to to really describe it all um, did, did it make you want to change your life after you had that experience then? Every time is, is, is different and you, naturally it's going to change anyway. And mm. some stuff came up that uh, I thought I had dealt with, I thought I'd processed it, but it was still, still there on a deeper level and it came out and, you know, you're crying or screaming or whatever, you're just, just getting it out. Even when you're throwing up, it's not a physical thing. It is obviously a physical thing you're throwing up, but it's almost like you're purging out negative emotions and things. Emotions even get stored in your body. You know, a lot, oftentimes when you get, or probably always, there's a psychological route to every kind of disease and pain and everything like that. So people sometimes spontaneously healed or the, the pain goes away because the emotion has created that pain. I have a friend that practices a different kind of medicine and it's been very successful. Uh, and he's explained to me every cancer has a trauma at some point in your life that was the root cause and actually when you get cancer it's the trauma is coming out and uh, they don't use any medicine they they process it out and it kind of goes away where here you go to hospital they tell you got cancer you sh 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 right into fear mode straight away all right so and then they give you toxic chemicals on top of that so uh, that's not going to go well if you know how to handle it psychologically and work through it, at least that's a new German medicine. If anyone wants to look that up, it's very interesting. What's that? Is so if someone is interested in that, what, what, what kind of... What new, uh, new German medicine. That's is actually it? literally what you would yeah, do. Uh, Dr. Hammer. Right. Um, it's not something that I practice, but I've, I've had conversations with, with somebody that had three cancers and they're still here. That's fascinating. Practicing okay. this. This mm -hmm. is interesting coming from you because you were a person who was a trial and error everything has to be fact-based and backed up with data. Mm. And now a lot of the, the stuff that you're interested in, um, it's tricky to prove, isn't it? it, it it's, it's, you know, there are, there is some evidence. Yeah, you can't put this in a box, man. Yeah. You know? uh, so, so the fact that uh, you that, can now that, believe that, that though, is um, interesting. That black and white, logical thinking Dorian mm. is now a lot more flexible. Mm. Um, actually, I had a lesson um, because people know I'm, I'm I'm a cannabis user and an advocate of, uh, of cannabis and for certain people, certain situations maybe. And I've helped a few people I know, friends, 
with uh, cannabis extract, cannabis oil, to cure their cancers. And the, you know, this is fact. I know them. It's, it's happened. So I went to one time. I went to the um, ayahuasca and the shaman and uh, had my little consultation with him. And he looked at me and he said, uh, "You use a lot of coffee?" I said, no, "I don't drink coffee." He said, cannabis? I said, yeah. Hmm, you need to use less. So there's me, the, you know, analytical, logical, less, but how much, but when? Once <laughs> right. a week, twice a week, what? He just laughed at me, he said, wait, see, ask, ask the plant, okay. How much were you, were you smoking at the time, do you know? I very much smoke every day, like, but not, not really lots. I'm still fairly disciplined with this as well, as like after my work's finished, and everything in the evening it's just like somebody else might have a glass of wine or whatever it's, you know go down the pub and you have one or two yeah. drinks I'll have a joint that's it and a little bit of um, do you ever combine it with a glass of wine sorry do you ever combine it with a glass of yeah, wine yeah a glass of red wine good shout that isn't it? <laughs> what a combination <laughs> Tell you and, uh, what. I have a couple of little in drops Amsterdam. of the extract before I go to bed yeah uh, anyway does that help though but, uh, for sleeping the way, the way <coughs> it, helps, joint it helps for sleep and um, it's um, it's basically a preventative medicine THC uh, is very powerful antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer medicine. It's, it's good for so many things. And don't have to take my word for it, guys. If you go search a guy called Robert Malamid, I think I'm pronouncing it right. He's a molecular biologist. And his field of expertise is free radicals. We're talking about exercise and free radicals. Free radicals aging and damaging your cells. And uh, he's the world's leading expert on it. And he says cannabis is number one uh, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory medicine that you can take. So anyway, you know, I got this love affair with uh, Mary Jane, yeah, cannabis. <laughs> so he's telling me I need to cut back a bit, yeah? How much, whatever. He's like, just laugh. He said, just wait. Just took the drink and, you know, there's so many things going on, so I'm just picking up one thing that I remember and uh, the plant was speaking to me in my mind and it's always a female voice and she said um, you think about water is water good or bad water's good there's no life on a planet without water and you know it's essential right water water's good yeah so water's good yes okay how about if you're fucking drowning in it oh it's not so good then. So what I learned from that experience is nothing is black and white. Nothing is black and white. And it changed the way I think from being so, this is good, this is bad, this is black, this is white. It just made me realize that it's not like that. You know, you've got to be a lot more flexible in your thinking. Mm -hmm. It was weird for me when I watched that London Real podcast, the original one, because at the time I was really into bodybuilding, but I was also researching 9-11 and all these. Uh, and to have the guy who I was aspiring to be like, in training come out with a lot of the things i was researching it was like shit like this is like and the way and you had your like facts I, I, I don't know how there's anybody on the planet at this point doesn't know that 9 11 was a planned demolition i mean it's so obvious mm -hmm. and there's so many people that were there that were saying that and a lot of those people had accidents or were murdered uh, there's just so much when you look into it it's blatantly obvious but well, these people that run the show they just think we're so stupid well we are that's the problem we're so stupid we're, we're, they, we they show us what they're going to do mm. in movies and, and TV they always show you before because there's a spiritual aspect to this there's a karma yeah there's karma attached but in a way we've given them permission we've said okay because they've showed us They've showed us what they're going to do, and we haven't protested and said, no, don't do that. Uh, it's called predictive programming. You can go back and, and movies. I was telling my daughter years ago, stop watching these movies, The Hunger Games and all these games, because every movie that's coming out now for the young people is about this dark, dystopian future. It's like programming your mind that this can and will happen. Uh, when the pandemic that wasn't a pandemic started, um, I went on my Apple box, yeah? You know, the, if you've got Apple TV, there's like the top mm. 40 movies or something. 
What's one was literally it? called Pandemic. Yeah, there was the like time. 10 pandemic virus contagion. Right, contagion. Yeah. They, they were there. There's like 10 of them. So <laughs> over the years, they've been preparing us mentally for this, that this could happen. And you could be in this ooh, scary future where there's a virus that's going to kill everybody. Everyone at the time when it happened was saying to me, we're going into lockdown. And I was like, wait, what the fuck's a lockdown? Like, what? Like, but everyone else was like, yeah, lockdown, lockdown. I also remember what my experience was at that time. And I'll admit, I, I, there was a lot of fear. I had a, yeah. I had a pregnant uh, wife yeah. and my dad was that's very- That's how they get it. Was very fear, seriously- Fear it, is the biggest weapon. I was very, they were very serious ill. And I'll be honest, I, you know, I, I, I think Brian and I discussed this on a podcast, the kind of doubt. For me, it wasn't even, uh, from my perspective, it wasn't me going, there's definitely a virus. It's, it's pretty much, I can't roll the dice with some of these people in my life. Mm -hmm. And I think they play on those, uh, some but people the, play on those aspects. There's always a virus. Sure. There's, there's you know, there's flu every year. Somehow flu magically disappeared. Mutations are gonna uh, happen. Yeah. There's always a virus. <coughs> so uh, if there was a pandemic, then surely the, um, so called like the mean uh, all cause mortality, mm -hmm. all cause mortality. You know, people that dying of, of everything would go up, right? Yeah. It wasn't. It's like 2020 is a little bit less than 2019 and 2018. So in Spain, there was a court case. Somebody took a case against the Spanish government, the health department of the Spanish government, and said, okay, you, you did all these measures because of COVID 19, right? Okay, so can you show us proof that COVID-19 exists and it has been isolated as a, you know, particular virus? They didn't even turn up in court. So now all the fines in Spain have to be paid back because right. there was no basis for the lockdown in the first place. Hmm. You're looking at the numbers Do you know of- Boris's father wrote a book about uh, how we need to reduce the population through a uh, virus. Yeah. Why am I not surprised that uh, one of the Johnsons wrote that? Yeah, I, um, oh, that makes perfect sense. They're, they're eugenicists. Mm. No shit. Uh -huh. uh, with the way they look as well. Isn't that mental? Um, uh, uh, it should start at home. But the, no, the, even no matter what, what anyone it. believes, I, I always try and look <laughs> at the numbers and base my behavior off what the numbers are saying. And even if the numbers are, are fake, uh, it, it, you, you kind of, even, even if they are fake, you gotta look at the government and go, your behavior does not match where we are now, even in your story. It doesn't even line up like right. 100, 100, we're in between 100 and 200 deaths a day from COVID. According how, how do we analyze that? With a PCR test that's it, absolutely useless? Exactly. But even if that is true, it doesn't make sense to be doing what we're doing now right. to me. Because we were at like, what was it? seven eight hundred or whatever before we locked down or whatever it was last time mm -hmm. to be acting like this before christmas now i'm they like hear what we're saying they're coming to get us sure. but uh, the, the credibility of the government uh, you know it, it surprised me how how many people b just sort of abided by all the rules to start with well, after they kept what, changing what it is story. the majority of people are literally hypnotized they're hypnotized by the propaganda and the tell lie vision um, and they can't really think for themselves and fear is like what happens when you're really in fear you just freeze mm -hmm, right. you just freeze you can't do anything you literally mm -hmm. freeze and that's that's the mode that a lot of people are in they're really they're really afraid and like, if you dare to stick your neck up above and go I don't agree with this you'll be absolutely annihilated by like the regular people do you yeah, know what yeah, I'm saying but if guess you say what, I don't man? agree with this guess or what? I want a better explanation you just gotta not give a fuck about that mm. the main the main thing is, is always got to like speak your truth. That's it, whatever it is. And uh, do you not think it's more hassle than it's worth do. sometimes, though? To yeah, be that what, person. What should we all do? Dip our heads below the parapet so we, no one can say anything, and we just keep on walking into this nightmare. I've got to admit, there is. Well, like, when, yeah. when we're in a place and everybody wakes up one day and says, "Shit, what happened? Mm -hmm. What's happened to the world? We can't do anything. We can't go anywhere. It's going to be too late." So people need to speak up now. I also well, we can. People are listening. Some people might disagree with me, but if there's one or two people that's like, you know what, I'm going to look into this a little bit more. That's all I tell people to do. Do your research. Have a look into it. Don't just blindly follow and do what you're told. You know, just like 60 million people were killed in in Russia by the government, uh, the communism in China, and uh, 
Pol Pot and you know it's happened before the government's not your friend and the government's supposed to be there to serve us not to dictate to us mm. all the time same as the police force supposed to be there to serve the public not to protect uh, the elite which is what's happening now basically that the foot soldiers uh, for the elite and that's where my frustration comes from because if after researching 9-11 and realizing okay whether or not it was an inside job they, uh, whoever did that the government definitely covered it up. Yeah, they took the base out it, and they had charges on every it, floor. Yeah, you watch any demolition, it's a 10 second to the, to the ground. That is exactly what happened with both the t uh, Twin Towers, free fall speed. There is no fire in the world that will... Gr Grenfell, is Gren Grenfell? Grenfell. Grenfell's yeah. still standing there. You know what I mean? It didn't just come down in rubble and that was an inferno, a proper fire, not a badly burning fire at the top. So when, when, when your brain accepts that, okay, they lied about this. I can't then trust them about anything after that because that was one of the worst things. That was things kind of like one of the major steps to take us to, to where we are now, yeah? Mm. And I, I told everybody, like, because I used to go to the States a lot and it all changed. You know, you can't take your water on, you're gonna do this, you gotta go through the scanner, all that stuff. So I said, this, naked this, body. Is, this is training stuff. He's hitting the double biceps in the scanner. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, when they see, when they see Dorian, they go, you're gonna have to get a scan. I don't get go scan. through the scanner. Right. Yeah. I don't do it, I don't, you don't go fit. through there. I don't go through there so you can and you know they try to make it inconvenient for it to not oh we're going to do a body search okay and wait there they make it wait and then they come along and they're like you know your private area I'm going to touch with the back of my hand and this try to like make you feel uncomfortable and humiliated so I just reverse it and I'm like you having a good time there my balls a little massage thanks mate you know <laughs> <laughs> then they get uncomfortable right yeah okay yeah yeah that makes <laughs> oh fucking hell so so yeah you 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 started talking about that on the Brian Rose podcast and uh, London Real. He he then sort of, that, that channel that blew boomed up. Yeah. off of, that was the first time I'd ever seen those two guys. It actually used to be two guys. Yeah, there were two guys <laughs> on my first uh, yeah. podcast. Was blood blood. Was, uh, Wait, it was two guys? Yeah, yeah. Was, I just thought uh, it was just Brian. Brian uh, it's Brian's thing, isn't it? Brian and uh, Nick mm. were um, originally London Real and the first one I did. Was right, on, so was who's, two guys, yeah. who's so, Nick? Nick Sorry, was the best friend of, or, or the, he was his jujitsu instructor, I think. Right. And Nick had, um, he was like, they were very different. Nick was the more enlightened one. Brian was the business banker. Never seen uh, that before. Um, and uh, and I loved that podcast. And uh, so naturally I started watching more. And um, Nick basically got the boot. And Brian just yeah, took, he, took he, it. he has his story. I think you can see it's yeah. on YouTube. He talks all about that. And, oh. you know, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but they were a team, the first one I did. And then yeah. Nick was gone and you know I didn't think or ask why really so you're saying the co-host needs to be careful well I, I watched um, <laughs> I, I did watch the Nick the Nick story and he he was less than complimentary of Brian he basically said we we started this together and then Brian fucked me off as soon as it started to get successful it's always a Brian isn't it oh ironically yeah, um, yeah. but <laughs> but the interesting thing was uh, you he asked you to do an interview recently and over the time London Real has been um, about the journey and growing who you are and then eventually it became an academy and you you know he he would do this thing where business you get, you get half the podcast course, on yeah. youtube for free and then you'd have to sign up to get the yeah. other half very uh, smart business model uh, which is ironically what he said to uh, to me when i went on his podcast and um i said look can i have the whole thing to put on my channel at a later date or whatever he's like yeah yeah and then after the fact I then asked him for the whole thing and he went, no, no, no. Um, so that's why I removed our podcast for those who wondered about Brian Rose because it's the only podcast I've ever taken down. But then Brian went into a different direction, um, uh, which was um, the Freedom Platform. And you get loads right. of people that donate money for that. Now, was that, with, was that the one with David Icke? Yeah, I right, think David right. Icke helped him launch that um, when he was doing the whole Ike Rose 3. So there was Ike Rose 1, there was, um, there were, then there was Frost Nixon 2, yeah. and then there was Ike Rose 3. So, so he inserted him, he, he was trying to grow his name off David Icke, basically. Right. Um, Who the, Freedom, the Freedom Platform got about a million donations, a million pounds worth of donations. <laughs> no fucking way! Yeah, and then, and then it never materialised. Yeah, it was more than that. More yeah, and so then, so and my, then, my experience with Brian and London Real was the first one I did with Brian and Nick. Um, I think I did a second one. Then I came to Spain and did a documentary. Mm. So, you know, it was mutually beneficial. I had never done a podcast before. And 
I didn't really like doing interviews and I've done a thousands of interviews and it's always the same bodybuilding questions. Mm. But what I liked about London Real is we went off on tangents and we, you know, we talked, but, but, yeah, before we went on, I was somehow came up the conversation with psychedelics and Nick was like, can we ask you about this on? I said, you ask me whatever you want, you know, I don't really care. Um, and it was super popular, right? It boosted London Real and it was good for me as well. Um, so it was all good until, and, and Brian was very good at his job. I think it was a very good interview. I had amazing guests on there. And uh, it was actually me that suggested, hey, take a look at this guy, David Icke. I think it would be interesting for your show. And initially didn't want to have him on there, but in the end he did. And whatever happened got took down from YouTube. Or, so it's like, well, we're going to fight this censorship, yeah? And the whole thing that was going on, with the pandemic and everything. We're gonna fight this. He made a lot of videos at that gonna, time, didn't he? We're gonna create an army, London right. Real Army. And everyone was behind it. Even me, you're like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's get, all get together and let's fight this. this is like, let's create a bloody mm -hmm. a movement. And then there was like protests in London with David Icke and, and different people speaking. And Brian was conspicuously absent. So I was thinking, are you really doing this? If it's not for your benefit and you're not leading it, you're not, you're not interested so you're not really interested he was certainly making a lot of videos but yeah, yeah. so he was he asking for money to be home. donated and everyone got behind it friends of mine donated money because they, they were with this cause create, you know build this freedom platform and he spoke to me so we're going to build this platform I'm like but why do you need all this money Brian to do the, the podcast because oh, we need to build the platform and it's not going to be just for me I'm going to build a platform like YouTube but everyone can use it and they can put on there what they want. You know, it's going to be a freedom, idea, freedom be platform. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, You know, and I'm not tech savvy or anything like that, but some of my friends were and they're like, mate, this guy hasn't created anything. He's just using existing platforms and not even that expensive. Mm. So that was the first thing. And some of my friends were then were messaging him on Instagram or where, wherever, basically asking like, you know, I donated money, I'm supporting you, but I've got some questions. He was delete, delete, delete. So the guy that was fighting against censorship was censoring his own followers. So I was a, freedom. It was a bit strange, but I still didn't really want to believe that he was ripping people off. There was also the business courses that he started. The business doing. courses. Yeah, I they, don't they know too much about terrible that. Terrible reviews but, uh, where people. I made a lot of money from mine, so the jokes yeah. on you two. And that's yeah. another. Okay. <laughs> Basically, because he spent a lot of time with this Dan Pena, this billionaire creator, he started yeah. doing his own business courses. Started wearing Dan suits as well. And then they did fit well. I though. don't know if they were good ideas, but but the guy was charging thousands and thousands of pounds, sometimes fifteen thousand pounds for a business course. I think worth every penny for and me. A lot of people were asking for their money back. Yeah. And I've seen footage that, of, yeah. of people in the street running up to Brian with a camera and he just, it's very political, ironically, deny, deny, deny sort of thing. And then after he's kind of burnt a few bridges there, he pivots again into politics and runs for mayor right after all that money had been raised. And a lot of people are like, okay, so you got a lot of money for the freedom platform. Why but that happen? hasn't really materialized the way we thought it would. And then you make a massive, expensive campaign for Mia. In which you spend, in which you spend a lot of cash. Well, the, that's, <laughs> no line's that's been when drawn. he contacted me to do a further interview. Right. So I know what he wanted to do. He wanted to interview me so it would seem like I'm backing him for Mia. Yeah? Mm. And he said he was second in the betting odds. But... He basically put money on himself, so that's how he got up in the betting. Did you see? Did you see that interview where he gets sort of rumbled, where the guy goes, "Yeah, but he goes, we're second in the odds," and he goes, "Have you put money on yourself?" And he goes, "I might have put money on myself because <laughs> if you have a massive bet come in, the, they have the, to the, the, odds the odds have yeah. to change." Well, the best one was with these young kids that interviewed him. Oh they, they my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. were like 15 years old yeah. and they showed him up, and he just <laughs> he had to get off. Oh, it's time to go now. I, I, I got to go. I got. To, my, they're telling me bye bye. Yeah, that so must be hard for you though the, because the you've thing, helped build this creature yeah. and now your name and your credibility as well as many other guests that he's had yeah. is helped create he, he had some amazing guests on mm. there it's a, such a shame because he had a brilliant podcast he was good at his job this freedom platform thing he could have really got behind that and mm. really started some people were getting behind him and so he asked me can you do this interview I said I can Brian but I'm going to bring this up because people ask him where's the money at 
oh, uh, you know, I don't really, uh, I can't really address that. I just want to talk about my thing from there. I mean, what I could have done really, but I could have just gone on there and ambushed him. He said, no, I can't, oh, we'll address this another day. I said, no, it's, I said, if that's the way you want to do it, mate, I'm not going to do the interview. And then I just put something on my Instagram saying, guys, if you're, you know, looking forward to the interview, sorry, I'm not doing it. And these are the reasons why. And I don't want to associate myself with Brian anymore because he can't answer these questions even to me. So uh, oh. that was it with with Brian. It's a shame he could have uh, he could have took it in a totally different direction. He's now into uh, crypto, so he's pivoted again, and he's basically got the nickname online as like the grifter who keeps on grifting. Right. Okay. And it, it, there's always somebody else out there that is going to be naive and he'll be able yeah. to. Rip of course, off. every yeah. town needs a monorail. Yeah. Have you ever seen that episode? <laughs> There's an episode of The Simpsons where there's a guy selling the monorail, the monorail, monorail, and then he goes to like Shelbyville and he goes to the next town and he sells them like the same crappy railway line. To be fair, yeah. the, the railway um, line's fantastic. Not saying that that's Brian Rose, of course, we wouldn't. Ever I'm actually just talking that. about a completely unrelated episode of The Simpsons. Um, but no, it, it's difficult. It's it is a shame when you've invested a piece of you, and I know how I felt about Brian after he told me one thing and then did a completely different thing. You're like nobody had a bigger impact on London Real than you like you're the reason I found out who they were and then I'll say like what he's allegedly how badly he's allegedly trapped people and even that campaign for me let's just speak facts it was cringeworthy well, yeah. the, 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 the problem the with the campaign what was the bus called he had a he was in the back of a bus with his pinstripe suit on every day taking calls and he's like hey everybody <coughs> he's getting no one viewing it the no one cared that, he spent that all was, that money that was the problem and it was an ego trip yeah. that's all it was but he did he's he, never gonna win his real problem I think was he ended up he ended up uh, running for mayor in the same year as I think well two predominantly uh, big YouTubers from the platform or they one, did it one for, big for and a one joke small, did it for a joke and they got more votes, both of them got more votes than Brian Rose. He spent over, apparently his budget, it was like the biggest budget in like running for mayor of London. But surely he must have known that he had no chance. I think, I think he did, but I think th this is the thing with him, the way it comes across anyway is like, just seeing his face on all those billboards, it got him off. It must have done something for him where, because the way Brian grew his career was being the other guy. So it's all about Dorian. It's all about David Icke. That's why when... That, that's funny because he made a documentary about myself. He came to Spain to film and all yeah. this stuff. And so we're having the premiere at the the BAFTA buildings, which was nice. And yeah. I bring all my friends and family and different guests and all that. We're watching it. And uh, I didn't see it before the premiere. I didn't particularly want to. I said, just do what you want, man. I'll come and watch it, yeah? And it started, and I'm like, it's all about Brian at the start. Yeah. So I used to be a banker, and this, and that, and that. And the first five minutes, I thought, where's, where's the Dorian? And then it, okay, then it shifts into it, but it's all, it's all about so, promoting himself. Exactly, basically. so th that's why when he did uh, the David Icke interviews, he called them Ike Rose, because what he's trying to do is take from your stardom, yeah. take from the David Icke stardom, and build himself up. But because he is... There's definitely skills there as a man. I'm not, yeah, I'm not yeah. saying it there was, isn't. It was great as a job. And because he wants to be the star, I think this was his chance where he thought, I'm going to use this as a springboard. Yeah. I won't win, but I'll have my face everywhere and that alone will be the win. And then I can pivot and bounce off of that. But it, it just made him look silly. Well, Brian, you know, he went to Saltara before me. As I said, that's how mm. I got connected with the Saltara. And he did his ayahuasca experience. Um, and the plant showed him lots of things that he got to work on and this and that. And basically, he did none of them. Yeah. You know, so it was just kind of a waste of time. And I, I just think, um, I don't feel bad about it because I got the the publicity as well. It was good for me. Got the word out there about a lot of stuff. Your friends who lost their money, mate. Yeah, I, f I feel bad for them. Mm. And uh, I actually feel bad for Brian because he got a lot of stuff he needs to work on. You know, yeah, really. That's the way I'm always left feeling with uh, Rose. Um, I, I, I think there's a little bit of small man with a lot, syndrome. A lot of, in there's that a guy as well. with a lot of issues, and yeah. he still hasn't worked through it. So anyway, there's, I don't want to talk about Brian all yeah, day. I, that, yeah. so I think it's enough that we spoke about it and, and cleared it up. My association with Brian is uh, is no longer there. Mm -hmm. 
now you're this this new version of Dorian like I guess um, you say you're always evolving and I, I was wondering like where your mind is at now with everything that's going on in the world and how, how you how you see things I believe now we're in a war it's World War three but it's just not a physical war it's more like a spiritual war and um, it's like a dark and light thing and uh, I, I have faith in God, light, universe, whatever you call it, that that ultimately that will prevail. Um, so that's where I'm putting my energy and, and faith and uh, undo my thing. Um, you know, playing my part in this whole kind of game that's going on. What, what do you? What is your part? Um, just that minute. Just by being me and speaking the truth. Uh, I think it has a domino effect on people. You see what's going on, and you're getting all this information coming in all the time, and it's, mm. it's all kind of intense, negative. Right. It can be very negative. Yeah. So I'm aware of what's going on, but I try not to let me let it make me be scared. Oh, in the future we're all going to be in camps if we don't have a V, and we're going to have digital passports for everything, and we're going to have no freedom, and we're going to have no right to protest, and all these things that is planned but I, I think their plans are slowly going to fall apart I, I feel like now we're getting to a point where people who in the past online I'd say like oh these people who, are, who aren't isolating and they'd be the ones like doing the basically like grassing people up for not isolating and I'm saying those people now turn on the government now going fuck it I'm not listening it's over it's done you know what I mean like they're gonna have to find a new reason other than save the NHS which we've underfunded for best part of god knows how many decades um but uh, you do wonder that people just want to be told what and to do how many people suffered during the lockdown when they were cancelling operations and not treating patients and all this stuff. Cancer patients And uh, old people they were giving end of life care to, mm. basically seeing them off with uh, benzodiazepines mm. and uh, morphine and stuff like that. It's come out now. I can't remember the name of the drug, but it's like a super strong uh, benzo that they were giving uh, people in the care homes, the old people, just mm. basically killing them off. I think more and more people who originally are skeptical of the David Ikes out there and whoever else um, are now coming around to at least saying this is getting weird, huh? Like yeah, because we all got um, a version of reality that we think the way the world is and it yeah. operates by the information that we've got right from life experiences, from school, from the media, from the TV. So we're given a picture. Um, we think that's the way things are and if somebody comes along and says no, mate, it's not like that that's all upside down it's very hard to take in at first mm. even if you're kind of an open person when I started coming across some information I was like well I don't know about that but then you know you see more and more and you just accept that uh, the world is different from the way that we thought it was when, when you started researching your um, you know the discovering a lot of these things what was the one that shocked you the most can you remember the thing that was like that's the penny dropping that's the moment that Dorian is never going to be the same now he knows that I had a friend that was uh, Serbian so I'm watching CNN all what's going on in the uh, Balkans war mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's telling me like mate my family's there that's not like that so I used to believe everything that I saw on the news, surely it must be yeah. like that. And now I, look, I don't even look, to be honest, but if I do, I can read between the lines and have a laugh about it. We're, we're, I've we're been seeing, to Kosovo, it's actually quite an interesting place to go to. Yeah, and we're, yeah. we're seeing the news is almost exposing itself now because independent um, people are now growing in power, like Joe Rogan, for example. <coughs> um, and people are switching off. They're yeah. switching off, that's what's going to happen. And that's why CNN are attacking Joe Rogan. I love and the calling speech him. that Ricky Gervais gave at this whatever awards oh yeah yeah brilliant because he's just in a dressed up as a as a joke he's telling the truth yeah and a lot of these things are going to come out with this uh, child trafficking and paedophilia right now is the biggest trial which is in Giselle, Giselle, Giselle. Oh yeah Ghislaine Ghislaine I think is yeah. the, the but, BBC have had to learn to say it as well so yeah, yeah but we uh, it's hardly being covered right yeah, yeah it's a bit weird, isn't it? Hardly being covered. Strange that. It's almost they're, like they're, they're putting the, the right... Most put of them the right, Pizza Express. Put the right judge in place yeah. and all this, so I don't know 
if the truth will come out of that but that's you know Andrew all, must be sweating on it though. all the uh, it's not that Andrew's like you like a lot of the elite politicians and so on was going out to that island yeah if you look at the book you look I mean, at the flight stunning. log yeah the flight yeah. log Bill Clinton Clinton really likes flying so does Donald Trump by the uh, looks of it the, you know these people they're they're different to us. They're, they're deeply evil. They're psychopathic. So they can do things that we wouldn't wouldn't dream of doing. For them, they don't have a psychopath doesn't have empathy. So, they, they and that's the it. thing is to push a button to to go to war or to know that hundreds of thousands of people are going to lose their lives. Innocent people, a lot, you know, like, who aren't even signing up for yeah. it. You have to be a certain kind of guy. You, you, and I think a lot or of a woman. Reg, yeah, a lot of regular people. We think, oh yeah, well that's what their job is. They're politicians, but the, the, you, we disconnect from them being their people. And you have to think, what kind of person can do that? What kind of person wants to have all that power? Would you have to be to conditioned? Maybe, maybe you go to a school where you're sort of taught those things, and you, I mean, you know, we've, I think the, you the have to be like Hillary Clinton and people like that. You have to be able to completely disconnect from human life and not care. And that's to me what these people are like. But that is partly what I find interesting, actually, because I do think the the British Britain's a much smaller island, so it's much more uh, sometimes it's a bit more difficult to hide away from. The, it's quite an intense media we've got here, right? And I do think during COVID, quite quite a few of those masks have slipped, and people have seen elements of the government being actually quite shit at their job in the but first got, place. Well, have you not seen how many they're, protests they're pretending, to, they're pretending <clears throat> to be incompetent? So we just think, oh, they're just stupid muppets, but no, no, they're not. Well, you see, that's they, why they, they that's have, why I actually find interesting. They have a reason. Is, they have a plan. You know? Yeah, that, that's actually kind of what I find interesting because I, I think a lot of people you know, are bumbling, taking bumbling in Boris, who doesn't know what he's doing, he knows what he's doing. Prickish, pretty, doing. Prickish, pretty so, and, so, yeah, the, the, the cunt, Rob. Another real all, shocker. Got nicknames. Another real shocker was how many protests during the this um, COVID period were not even covered. were not covered, and I'm talking when you do see the video of them on a social media, you're like. Wow, <laughs> like these, this is like tens of thousands not of people. Not tens of thousands, hundreds, hundreds of yeah. thousands. And, and not, not one media outlet is even mentioning it. And that's when you go, are you still going to believe what this lot are saying? Because yeah. news is news. It's not, well, we cover this or we don't cover that. News is news, Again, allegedly. Again, it's bad perception. Yeah. If they showed hundreds of thousands of people have come together very peacefully to make a protest people might think you know what they've got a point I'll join them if you don't know about it you can't you know exactly I've, I've actually I've, I've not been to those protests um, just got been busy but uh, there, there were <laughs> it's true but, uh, <laughs> get my nails done I've been, I've been caught I've been sort of caught by them or they've yeah. passed by and I, I, I did a walk with, her, yeah. uh, with my daughter Tani and she's been with her friends as well and uh, not when I was there but when my daughter was there she saw the police running into a peaceful cloud and just start beating people. Yeah. And then they say, these extremist anti-vaxxer protesters were violent. No, the protests before, the whatever is it, Black Lives Matter and Antifa, they were violent. And you just sit back and let them... Right. Let them go it, ahead. It, it's clever how they reframe it and call it... Because like, you could be anti-lockdown and not anti-vax but they but the but, I'm not anti but, anything but anti-vax it, it it's that it's a dirty word isn't it where they it's make labels, you look like you know, a crazy to separate person you, separate yeah. you. i'm not anti anything i'm just yeah. pro-truth yeah pro-truth and pro-freedom freedom that's of choice it. especially freedom, and i think man. the fact that we're now getting to a point where all right they're not saying everyone is going to be pinned down and vaccinated but they're making life as difficult as possible for you to live without that vaccine is the same thing almost. Yeah, because they're very concerned about your health. Apparently that's so, That's why yes. they're doing it, yeah? yeah. Yeah, they really were concerned when they went uh, to Iraq, and there was, turns out there was no weapons of mass destruction, but it was worth losing so many and thousands then, of lives. And then after, after this, George Bush was even making a joke about it. Yeah. He was doing a speech and he's like, hold on, where's the mass, weapons of mass destruction? Are they here? Are they here underneath? Wow. Making a joke with his mates. Yeah. You know? you, uh, we were in the, uh, we went to an award show where Tony Blair was there once, and, I've never been in a room before with someone who looks quite as evil. And like, you know when they say like the life you live turns up on your face almost. Like, you, you, you look quite stress-free, Dorian. This man looked pure, he looks like he belonged in Star Wars, didn't he? Do you know what I'm saying? It wasn't- a, yeah, Take a look yeah. at him when he's younger. Well, there's, there's, there's a spiritual aspect to this. For sure. Which, you know, it could go in a deep rabbit hole and, and might lose some people's interest if you go too right. deep. Fuck but, 
entities, there's powers that live outside our vision that these people, that's why they do this satanic ritual so they can tune into this. Mm -hmm. and, and basically the way I see it is like, if you get deep into this, you can have whatever you want in this physical world. Um, but you're paying a price and you can see it in the, in the eyes. Mm -hmm. The guy's lost his soul, basically, if, if you want to put it like that. There's, there's a lot of celebrities who do this picture where they cover one eye as a sign that we're in the club sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Lot, we lot, should just do that. Compromised. Because they've been put in compromising positions mm. like this guy Epstein and, and, and Maxwell mm. provide this underage girls or whatever it is that goes worse than that. But And then they'll probably be filmed or photographed doing all this stuff. So well, now Epstein you, now had cameras like, everywhere what, what all, is, all over Sorry, what's worse than them? Um, uh, the sacrificial right, killing okay, of the children, yeah, yeah, right, uh, okay. you know, the sacrificial uh, ceremonies and stuff. You just check out how many children go missing every year. I don't know, in the UK, a couple hundred thousand children go missing every year. And wow. They don't turn up anywhere. I didn't know Where it was that number. That's incredible. Yeah, going? right. I didn't know it was that high. That's amazing. Yeah. That's I, I don't know the exact figure, right, but okay. it's, it's, funny it's very high. Yeah, right. it's, it's ironic because obviously, like I say, I don't believe everything David Icke says, but years ago, he was banging on about this. And he was saying, like, they're going away to... Uh, even Alex Jones, I remember him coming out with a, a phrase, pedo island. And, and, and people are like, oh, yeah, as if they've got an island they all fly over to. And then, you know, years later, the Epstein case comes out and it's basically nailed on what, what that was. I remember one of the books I read, early ones from David Icke, was like an eyewitness that was at some <coughs> ceremony with Edward Heath, who was prime minister at the time. Yeah. And they were, you know, they're sacrificing kids and stuff. And I thought, that's, that's far out, yeah. And then I saw an interview fairly recently with a policeman who's now a whistleblower. He was, um, used to work as, uh, you know, outside Downing Street. And he said at two o'clock, three or four times a week, two o'clock, 2 a.m. In, in the night, a car would roll up and four or five, six-year-old boys would come out and they'd have to take them in because, you know, there's processes, right? And they'd be there for a couple of hours and then shipped off again. Mm. So they knew what was going on. And he was a well-known um, pedo, wasn't he? Edward Heath. Has that come, come proven now? No, the, the kind, well, this was, you know, he was there. He said he saw it and he said, what should we do? What, what, what yeah. can we do, you know? Um, if we go tell the higher-ups, maybe they're just going to move us on anyway. Yeah. So let's have a word with him. He said, we spoke to him and said, sir, this, whatever's going on, like, we know we're seeing it and it's got to stop. So he said it stopped and about two weeks later they were sent somewhere else and that's supposedly how um, Jimmy Savile r remained safe for as long as he did is because he was He's a facilitator yeah so all yeah. of these um, kids hospitals and all of that that he'd set up the whole charity thing for him was a way of hiding a, a way of putting up a, almost a protective shield that I'm the charity guy you know and all of not these everyone's like that uh, yeah, yeah. Some people we, do charity we're actually raising reason. money for charity yeah, right yeah, now quite, yeah. quite literally genuinely yeah. uh, but he, he he used this as a way of according to David Icke, pr procuring the kids for these higher ups. And when you say Jimmy Savile, the radio DJ, photographed with all these royals and all these political people like Thatcher, you're like, why was this guy so in, in with them? And then, you know, it all comes out after he's dead. Now, now it's obvious, right? Yeah. Fucked and up nothing it. comes out until people have passed away. If they're protected. Yeah. Yeah. It might come out after the fact. Cyril Spiff, the, you know, the, uh, liberal guy, a big fat politician that was in the Liberal Party. It's mm -hmm. all come out about him now, but he's, he's not here anymore. Fucking hell. So. You're quite a prominent figure, though. Does it never... Um, do you never feel an element of concern for your own sort of safety within that? What, for speaking out? Yeah, this isn't a threat, but I'm just sort of asking. I don't think I'm <laughs> really big enough to be concerned about that. I mean, if you're going to be afraid to speak your mind... What's, what's the point? You, you know, you, right. you're getting into that fear mode again. You should be able to freely speak uh, what you think. And everybody should be able to do that. And there's so much control. It's been getting more and more intense. Almost like controlling what people think. Or and trying how they, And to. how they speak, right. speak. You know, you can't. It's not politically correct that's to say the, that's this the trick and to say that. Though, yeah. You know, it's offensive. Fucking everyone's offended now. 
Mm. But it's social engineering. It's engineering the way that we even think. It's through the media and the TV mm. and the movies and what have you. It's in uh, and, and schools. I feel like men like yourself, and, and I class myself as a similar kind of guy, it, like it's a dying breed and it, 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 it's, un, it's very much like <coughs> seen as a bad thing almost. And you've got this new word called toxic masculinity. Yeah, well, I was thinking of that myself. Yeah, and, and, and don't get me wrong, like anything can be toxic, anything yeah. can. But that word alone, it's, it's almost suggesting if you're too masculine, <coughs> that's a bad thing. Well, too anything is a bad I, thing. Exactly, but, yeah, but that, sure. so by its very nature, it's a stupid word. Um, because what you should just say is like- Masculinity. Someone's an arsehole, you know what I mean? Right. Or whatever, but th it, it does feel like now, uh, you know, my experience on social media is if I, if I speak out and say anything that is a bit too self-assured and, 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 and show signs of being an alpha male, it is a bad thing now. People react in a bad way. And I'm fucking pissed off with it, if I'm Fuck honest. Them, like, man. It's annoying Fuck me. them. Be who you yeah. are. You know, that's, that's what I'm saying. There's pressure to, to mold people and mold the way that they think and the way they behave. Mm. And you just got to break that and, and, and be yeah, who you are. Be to, who you can are, I man. just interject on that? I think I kind, of, I kind of agree in my experience be the same. Obviously, uh, not necessarily embodying the classic alpha male ideas. But... Um, what I, what I do find interesting, and I think a lot of people um, hear what you say, and they say, um, and you're saying, be yourself. And I, I think that's a really great message. But what the, we, we, I almost want to go a step further and say, when you are yourself, and when you are honest, and when you are saying what you really think, you'll actually get very honest feedback from the world as well. You're not basically saying, go out and fuck everyone else. You can think whatever you want, and that won't change you. You're saying that if you are your, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I'm kind of putting a the theory out there. That if you are yourself, then through those experiences, you will learn. Um, you'll also learn about yourself, and the world will reflect back to you. So, if you are wrong about something, or you know, you put an, if you put an opinion out there, you'll get feedback on that. Yeah, and that and that that changes you as a person, and you adapt. But it's why no, that feedback's coming is the question. Well, so. but, but I'm not saying that fee feedback I mean, won't always be negative. It's the same thing with me with bodybuilding. I might have perceived, and maybe I did for some period of time that people expect me to be this guy. Right. So I should be this guy to keep everybody happy. No, be yourself. And what I learned is like, actually pe more people follow me now because I'm just being genuine. And in this world, which is full of bullshit, people find they pick up on that. There's something different, it's a guy being genuine and they relate to it people know when you're bullshit and they know when you're being genuine instinctively they know that and I think they find it refreshing if somebody's honest mm -hmm. and ultimately you can't think well how should I behave to keep everybody happy you'll never keep everybody happy anyway so be yourself and that's you know, the don't, don't that's think oh I can't say this I can't do that because I might upset somebody or it's not the trend at the moment that's how we're controlled you and know it's almost like uh, you don't need a sheep dog to keep all the sheep because they'll do it themselves when you step out of line everybody starts Come on. no 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 sure. no no you know don't do this don't dress mm -hmm. like that don't do that and then you think oh to fit in i better stay within the herd what do you what so do can you, I, yeah. I just say one thing that i'm struggling with right now online is like is kind of what you're getting at there is there's people who are searching for reality, the truth, information, knowledge, yeah. and there are some people online, the vast majority, who want to listen to things that make them feel better about their life, feel better about them, and it not, not necessarily care about being real, but just want to hear nice things. And those people, when they are hit with a character like myself or, or many other people out there, they they fucking flip out. They're like, oh, this is this is, and, and they're offended, and they try and shout you down, and they try and organise things to yeah. take you down, and 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 there's a lot of that um, cancel culture out there right now. Cancel culture a lot of the time are people offended by someone speaking the truth, um, you know, and they 
they can't a lot of these pussies who, who haven't got the balls to stand up and be counted would rather have that person who has that strength not there anymore so they can go back to feeling yeah, better making them feel uncomfortable uh, and, 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 and I'm fucking I'm really fed up with that shit um, mm. and I think that that unfortunately is like this I'm offended thing online right now it's getting bigger and stronger and stronger and, and people who I used to know who were part of the, the stand up and be counted guys are now on that side and they're yeah, doing the concert they've like, been beaten yeah into or, that or, or they want to be on the winning team and yeah. they want to be seen as the knight in shining armor but they even i almost feel more disappointed a than lot them of people guys. just want to fit in yeah they, they don't want to be you know ostracized and feel they don't fit in and so on um fortunately that never concerned me about trying to please people or, mm. or fit in i don't want to go out of my way to hurt anybody or anything like that but if what i'm saying is just my opinion and you're offended then Tough shit, really. Like, like if yeah. I'm watching a YouTube video and I, and, I, and I don't like what I'm saying... Turn it off. I'll turn it off. Yeah. I won't leave bitchy little comments. No, I get, I get people... The majority of people on my social media is very positive, but there's always somebody, you know? Yeah. And I just think, you know, why have you taken time out of your day <laughs> yeah, to come on my page if you don't like what I'm saying or you don't like me or whatever and taking your time out of your day to... To make a post about it. Because they're, they're upset, Dorian. They're all upset. Well, go somewhere else they're if you're upset. They're pussy mentality. Yeah, go somewhere else if you're upset. I right? see. Does, you could disagree with me, by all means. Yeah, of course. It, I might be wrong as well. I might but, next week say, you know yeah. what, Brian? I, I thought this. but yeah. I found this, so I changed my mind now. Have you found just, that a lot in your, yeah. in your journey? Sometimes, yeah. You're, you're constantly evolving. So what you might have thought, before you might find some new information and, and modify your yeah. viewpoint so yeah I can, everyone can be wrong right nobody's right all the time that would be impossible because i'd imagine there are also it's not again, about being right all the time it's just expressing your uh your view and your opinion how you feel right now everybody should be able to do that that is part of cancel culture i think I, um <clears throat> it encourages less people to take a shot at least at being right or at least putting their opinion it, out it there to test does, it. absolutely and that's yeah, the point. just in case it. you put it on your page and everyone's, you're an asshole, you're wrong, and like, ooh. Well, that's part know? of it, and, and that's kind of what I do appreciate. I, you know, I mean... Going I further back, the, the men who, so, who weren't this, I'm offended, like, you know, culture, those were the men that went to war. Those were the men that saved this country from, you know, losing our freedoms and stuff like that. Those were the stand up and be counted kind of guys. And those are exactly the kind of guys who are barely around anymore. If you can suppress the male and control the male, then you can control mm. the rest of the society because they're the guys at the front, they're the warriors. You mm. know, the women, the female and the male both have their roles to play, but that's the male role was always to provide and protect for, for the family. So mm. if you move the male out of the, the equation, and break up the family then you've got a lot of dysfunctional other males mm. growing up that are easier to control so it's it's you know it's a planned effort it's not something that's just spontaneously happening through society uh, it's uh, it's a planned assault so it will be easier to control like like now uh, i think we'll, we'll better wrap this up now you got uh you got family here so we'll, uh, impressive yeah last question is always the same uh how would you like to be remembered um, <clears throat> Frank Sinatra song did it my way that's it there you go did it my way did live my life the way I wanted to live it mm. and hopefully inspire other people to do the same uh, that was Dorian Nates on the True Geordie podcast uh, great to have another one of my uh, idols on here and uh, we'll put the links in the description below for DY Nutrition you've got your own supplement company yep. you're on tour You've been smashing that lately. Yeah, I've just done a two-week tour of the whole uh, UK. A lot yeah. of the big gyms have been from Durham all the way down here, back to the Midlands, back down here mm -hmm. again. So that's finished. I'm spending some time with my daughter now, chilling out. And uh, on Friday, I go to Glasgow doing a little training camp up there and then back out to Spain for, uh, for Christmas. Awesome. Uh, well, I'll put the links for Dorian's socials below as well if you want to follow the man the legend Dorian Yates do so and uh, thanks for watching thanks for having me on mate thanks a lot thank you appreciate it see you later